Hello all. I don't want this. Welcome to the second global webinar on forensic science. Uh, my name is Nawaz Sheikh. I'm the host of this conference. And I welcome all the speakers and participants to join this conference and uh, present to the uh, very informative and uh, exciting uh, speeches and presentations. And let me introduce uh, our chairman of this conference. Uh, our chairman, chairman of the conference is uh, Professor Anthony Shambery. He is former police commissioner in New York and he's a professor in Sheffield Hallam University, United States. And uh, I request Professor Anthony to start his uh, opening uh, speech. Good morning, one and all. Please let me read a prepared statement. Uh, a very good morning to all speakers, delegates and student participants and welcome to the second global webinar on forensic science. My name is Professor Anthony Shembri. I'm a former police commissioner in upstate New York and former deputy chief of the Homicide Bureau in Brooklyn and a professor at Sheffield Hallam University in England. Aren't you impressed? I am chairperson of this conference uh, and uh, on behalf of the organizing committee, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to our meeting, the second global webinar on forensic science organized by the Global Scientific Guild. More appropriately, organized by Nawaz and Sandy. And let me give a shout out to both of them that this program could not have occurred without them. Thank you both for bringing all of us together. There is a hunger out there for this kind of education and training. Today marks an enormous event initiated by the Global Scientific Guild, which will provide the opportunity to share research findings and encourage new collaborations to interact in various areas of forensic science. Several years ago, I wrote a paper for the Police Chiefs magazine on bringing research to practitioners. And I always felt, even today, how important this really is. Global Webinar on Forensic Science is a scientific congregation that brings together researchers, scientists, key decision makers, industry professionals in the same physical space for a brief yet intense period of discussion, collaboration, and generation innovative solutions to address challenges related to the theme insights and innovation in forensic science progressing to the future. We are very pleased to welcome you to both share and witness advances in this field together. This conference has attracted speakers and delegates from all over the world. I would like to thank all speakers and event partners for their continuous support and patronage. The Global Scientific Guild also wishes to thank all of the organizing committee members who have put in long hours and generated many creative ideas to bring this meeting together. Finally, we thank each and every one of you, the participants at this conference. We hope you enjoyed the conference and your participation will lead to new ideas, collaboration and research initiatives. Welcome, welcome, welcome. You know, to all of you, I have, uh, I've given lots of speeches and this is a first for me. It's 5 a.m. in Florida, and I've never given a speech in my pajamas. So welcome to all of you, uh, and I will start my presentation, which should last about 45 minutes. My thank presentation- you. Thank you. About thank you so much, Professor Anthony, for, uh, for the opening 
speech. Thank you so much. Uh, my pleasure. I request uh, Professor Anthony to start his uh, uh, presentation. Okay. Uh, my presentation is going to talk about crime scene management and give you a vicarious experience. Also, unfortunately for you, I have a sense of humor and I like to use it. So what I will do from time to time, we're dealing with a very serious business. And from time to time, I like to take a minute and have a little fun and break it up. So bear with me. Um, so my idea here is to give you a vicarious experience about managing crime scenes. And the number one, there are two traits that you need in order to manage a crime scene. If people could say no to you, you can't work for me. And the second one is you have to be able to think on your feet. So these are the two skills I look for when uh, detectives come forward. All right. Usually. Yeah. Thank you so much, Professor Anthony. That was really a wonderful presentation. Okay, uh, are there so any questions? Are there any questions? Uh, any questions for Professor Anthony? Yes, yes, I have one question. Yes, please. Yes, I uh, see uh, Dr. Deralou from Mont Saint Hilaire. Who was the expert for the bite mark case? For the what? The bite mark case. Who was the expert? Um, he was a forensic odontologist. I forget his name. He went on, uh, he was the forensic odontologist that went to Argentina when they uh, dug up a Nazi. Um, I forget his name. Very famous from New York. Okay. A forensic odontologist. Okay, but that, was there a match with the bite mark? Yes, yes, yes. And by law, we can take a bite mark. By law, we can take a bite mark. Next okay. question. Thank you for your question. Uh, any more questions? Uh, Diane Watson, is there any question from your side? Okay. The, um, okay. Well, I will uh, say goodbye to everyone and wish them a great conference. Thank you, Nawaz. Thank you. Goodbye. Yes. Goodbye, all. Yes. Goodbye. Thank you. Uh, okay. And... Uh, okay. How do okay. I get out of it? Oh, leave, uh, leave. Uh, hello, Dr. Sepini. Yes. Okay. Hello. Next speaker is Dr. Giuseppina Sepini and Dr. Yolando Ippolito from Forum Lex Association Italy. And they are going to give a presentation on algorithms, AI, gender stereotypes, and violence against women. And I request Dr. Sepini to start her presentation. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much to organizer. Uh, the Dr. Yolanda Polito apologizes, but uh, cannot be present for the commitment um, uh, of the ministry for the, when um, we should work now. Well, I'm going to share my, my, my slide. Just a moment, please. Okay. Okay. Just a moment. Okay. Okay, perfect. Uh, first, let me introduce myself. 
Uh, I'm um, a director of the Mount Regional Office of Forum Lakes Association. Forum Lakes Association uh, is an association that deals uh, with the fight against crime and violence, uh, baby gang cyber bullying, which different professionals belong um, a voluntary basis. And there are offices on almost the uh, entire national territory uh, in the Italian territory, obviously. And for the Forum Lakes Association, I'm also a member of the National Department of Gender Violence and Child Protection, member of the national sector on the national international communication, member of the National Department on Psycho and Physical Health and Armed Force and Law Enforcement, and member of the Scientific Technical Committee. I'm also a member of the International Association of Forensic Nurses, a member of the Worldwide Association of Women Forensic Experts. Well, I'll be speaking about to you, uh, I'll be speaking to you about uh, um, algorithms, uh, algorithm and artificial uh, intelligence and uh, how this affects on um, gender stereotypes and violence. Um, Algorithm and uh, artificial intelligence uh, are now increasingly uh, um, used to offer jobs uh, or any other services. Uh, they are uh, um, influencing behavior. Uh, um, decision that create the algorithm, the data sets uh, that fill them uh, on the outputs that result from algorithm decision making uh, can be biased, potentially harming women and perpetuating discrimination. Um, and important things, uh, there are uh, so many racial or gender prejudices uh, present within uh, the web. Um, prejudices that we can call the unsupervised computer vision algorithm can transform, learn, and make them their vision their own, even without the intervention of a specific category or labor to support them. Uh, these algorithms are therefore able to learn prejudices and stereotypes through the representation that is made of people individual in uh, the virtual world, but um, what uh, what are the, the unsupervised computer vision algorithm? Well, uh, um, we talk about uh, a particular category of computers. We talk about uh, machine learnings. Uh, these machine learnings, learnings is the recognition of patterns and rules by computers. Instead of uh, reacting uh, solely to input of a human um, user, machine uh, must be able to make a decision autonomously based on the rules learned. The algorithms can, uh, for example, learn to correctly recognize um, or understand the contact of an image. Uh, these algorithms are able to extract uh, the relations, the relationship between the data contained within uh, it from a database. These are algorithms that are not able to make prediction, but they try to bring out uh, characteristics and similarities from data sets with the aim of dividing data into related groups or of identifying specific correlation and defining recurring rules. Obviously, we are talking about so-called clustering activities with strong ethical implication, especially if the data sets are made up of images of women and men from different backgrounds of ethnicities. Obviously, the resulting categorization process can bring out any prejudices rather than stereotypes representative, for example, of a particular thought present within a group or a specific um, cultural context. But uh, mm, where do the bias come from in uh, unsupervised models 
but was uh, but what it is the region to explain it let's go back to the source uh, imagine it they that it is the immense database that contains images collected by flicks and the other internet sites and um, we can define it uh, um, is a faithful representation of the type of images that we can find on the web in the cyberspace and as we know today the web is a mirror of our society and at least of the western one it is no co coincidence that the categories within imagenet show a disparity in the representation of a certain and genders or racism. These disparities create favorities towards a given category, giving rise to most of the existing biases, then absorbed by the algorithm themselves. Well, to ensure that uh, an algorithm does not discriminate against a woman or a girl, one should not act uh, on the algorithm, but uh, on the available data. That is, make sure that they are less and less sexist and uh, misogynistic and consequently act on the behavior of people. The algorithms are representative of a history. They cannot be modified and uh, on which it adjusts its behavior. It is representative of society and tell of, uh, tells of a specific cultural context, uh, but, it can, but uh, it can also be predictive or a particular trend, uh, which could be acted upon instead. Uh, a particular consideration, gender bias uh, mm, uh, has various forms uh, uh, of discrimination against women and girls, obviously, and um, this bias pervades all spheres of life uh, in cyberspace, in virtual space, but also in, uh, in the, real, the real world. Uh, women's equal access to science and information technology is no exception, is no exception, for example. Uh, for example, if uh, artificial intelligence and automation uh, are not developed and applied in a gender responsive way, they are likely to reproduce or reinforce existing gender stereotypes. And also a discriminatory social norms. In fact, this is already happens unconsciously, consciously. Also, in a reporting uh, um, highlights in 2019 by UNESCO, uh, it is not a coincidence that a virtual personal assistant like Cortana, like Alexa, like Siri have a female names and come with a default female voice. Companies behind these virtual assistants are reinforcing the social reality in which a majority of personal assistants or secretaries in both public and private sector are women, of course. Gender bias also affects artificial intelligence algorithm as, as well. In fact, 78% um, of the artificial intelligence professional being men, male experiences inform and dominate algorithm creation. This gender bias can have a significant adverse implication for women. Uh, also in political war and in, in, um, in, in, in economic context, for example, uh, algorithms could after, could after women access to job and loans by automatically waiting, uh, waiting out the application or giving women applic applicants an unfavorable rating. Similarly, the algorithm based risk assessment in criminal justice system could work against women if the system did not factor in that women are less likely than men to reoffend. But we can't, uh, 
we can remember important things, but um, however, algorithms can be used to support women victims uh, of violence. One in 10 women has already suffered some form of violence computers in the age of 15, and the online harassment continues to arouse concern in the development of artificial intelligence, including education. Online violence is often directed against women in public life, such as activists, for example, women in politics, and other in public figures, but non exclusively. It's important to remember, for example, the algorithms and the artificial intelligence can be used to support and to development natural language processing for a contrast for fight misogyny identification, gender inequities, stereotypes and discrimination can also be created and reproduced through the language and the images disseminated by the media from artificial intelligence based application. It's, uh, it's more important uh, uh, to act uh, by education, cultural programs, and content audiovisual, uh, audiovisuals have a significant influence, uh, influence uh, in shaping the belief and the values of people and to combat stereotypes of gender. Of gender sorry. But uh, how can uh, how I can say uh, before uh, algorithms to support women victims of violence? Uh, there is a particular system called uh, Biogen. This is a, an integral monitoring system in case of gender violence. Uh, uh, um, this is. Uh, technically uh, a system uh, created by the, the, the Spanish government. And uh, um, it is, uh, um, it, yeah, you have a particular compatibility with uh, many software browsers. Browser, and um, it, it, um, it can be used for a fight and contrast crimes, uh, crimes related to gender violence. Um, infraction and criminal records of the alleged perpetrator and uh, their penitentiary situation. Uh, uh, it's uh, um, an important software for uh, fight uh, for fight the, the violence against uh, against uh, women. Uh, inside this software, uh, we can uh, we can find uh, identify data such as um, passport as well as other identification documents, photographs, addresses, telephone numbers, et cetera, et cetera. And also uh, another records, important records for uh, tracing uh, uh, the perpetrators. Uh, another important thing, uh, uh, it is not the algorithm that discriminates uh, or not, but the political logic of the person who is next uh, it. It is necessary to move more and more towards logic oriented to the uh, enhancement of differences. Well, uh, um, concluding reflection. How we can, uh, what can we do? How do uh, we stop bias? Well, at first, um, by making sure that women are not only consumers, uh, but producers of artificial intelligence. We need uh, mm, more female intelligence in artificial intelligence, in data, in algorithm, and uh, also in the sector, in, the, in this specific uh, a specific sector. It's important to emphasize and emphasize the collective responsibility, accountability necessary to ensure that the gender gap in a, the analog world and, on the, and not only in the digital world, as well as in the digital world, of course, does not continue to widen. It's important to promoting gender equality in the entire artificial intelligence life cycle through policy recommendation and programmatic support. 
It's important and it is necessary to act on the deep rooted prejudices on the strong gender imbalances in digital skills education, which are reflected on the gender imbalances of the technical teams that develop artificial intelligence technologies. And uh, if, we, if uh, we do not act uh, in an important way, artificial intelligence risks have a negative impact also on the economic emancipation of women. There is an increased need to develop artificial intelligence solution that prevent and combat online violence, violence and harassment, sexual and online exploitation against women and girls, and helping to educate young people in particular way, as well as the development and implementation of effective measures to address the, all the new form of online harassment for victims also in the workplace. Furthermore, measures should be developed which fully integrate the gender dimension, including awareness campaigns, training and program study. We should provide information to citizens on the function of algorithms and their impact of the daily lives. The users must always be informed about the use of an algorithm in order to take the decision of the matter in particular if it is a decision of an access to performance or to a product. The inclusion of a skill should be ensured digital and artificial intelligence training in a school curriculum and make them accessible for all as a means to bridge the digital gender gap. Thank you so much for your attention. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Sepini. Uh, it was really an excellent presentation. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, any questions for Dr. Sepini? Any questions? Uh, yes, I have a question. Yes, please. Yes, please. Thank you for your pre uh, presentation, Dr. Sepini. Yes. Um, thank you. I am in South Africa, and currently we are having a big issue with gender-based violence or violence against women. Um, this program that you mentioned, Viagen, the tool used to track um, gender-based violence in your country, um, who provides that tool to the public? Is it the police or the government? How has it been implemented? In Italy, we have this program. Uh, 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 this program is uh, um, uh, about the, the Spanish government, and uh, we have another type of uh, program, uh, but no biogen. But uh, we can, uh, it is possible to have this, this program. If you want, you can, um, um, you have my contact, we can, uh, we can contact me, um, I leave you my, uh, I can you more inform, more information about this. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, thank you. Uh, any more comments? Any questions? Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sepini. That was Welcome. excellent presentation. Thank you so much. Okay. And moving on, our uh, next speaker is uh, uh, Madhusri Konala. She is from Telangana Forensic Science Laboratory, India. And uh, she is going to present on reliability of diatoms test in drowning cases. And I request uh, Madhusri Konala to start her presentation. Congratulations to all of you for being the part of this uh, second global forensic science uh, uh, webinar. Welcome to my presentation. I will focus, uh, in my presentation, I will focus on the topic, the reliability of diatoms test. In this test, uh, um, this test is being used by 
uh, many forensic biologists for uh, analyzing forensic samples of uh, death due to drowning cases. In India, in most of the uh, forensic labs, uh, we conduct only this test uh, to know whether a person is died due to drowning or not. But there is a lot of controversy over this, uh, uh, over the credibility of this test by many forensic scientists. So that's why I have chosen this topic for my presentation today. Okay, next, how can I do this? Uh, how can I do this? How can I go to the next slide? Yeah. Uh, I'll talk briefly about the diatom uh, and the basic principle behind the test and procedure of the analysis. Finally, case studies. So diatoms are silica coated unicellular algae that are present in all water bodies and also in damp places like damp tree branches, walls, stones, etc. They encased in a fustule made up of a silica, which is an acid resistant. Uh, there are over 12,000 to 30,000 different species with uh, many, many shapes and sizes. According to internet uh, source, a bucket full of uh, water water contains millions of diatoms. So due to their abundant presence uh, in the water and also their acid resistant uh, silica fustule, they play a significant role in uh, analyzing death by drowning case samples. So the basic principle is uh, um, while a person is uh, drowning, a large amount of uh, water enter into the lungs and uh, heart of the and the heart of the person through nostrils uh, from which the water enter into the bloodstream from there the water enter into the bloodstream and finally the items that are present in the water uh, through the bloodstream and reaches the bone and get deposited there so diatoms uh, that are deposited in the deceased sternum bone or a long bone uh, um, can, um, are observed under the microscope after acid digestion of the bone. So if a, a person is already is thrown into the, if a dead body is already uh, Sorry, I'm sorry. If a person is already uh, dead while entering into the water, then transport of diatoms to various organs is prevented due to lack of blood circulation. Hence, if we find diatoms in sternum bone, then we consider that uh, uh, the death is due to drowning. In case absence of diatoms in sternum bone, the case is considered as death was not by drowning even though we find diatoms in lungs because there may be a passive entry of water into the lungs when a bed, when a dead body is thrown into the water so uh, since 28 years uh, have been working for uh, forensic science laboratory hyderabad india as a forensic serologist uh, and biologist. As India being a highly populated country, populated country, uh, I have analyzed, uh, we have to analyze a high number of uh, uh, cases. And I have analyzed more than 50K cases uh, with uh, 70K to 80K case samples of death due to drowning. So the results are pretty confusing. That's why I wanted to share my work experience with you all and like to have a discussion on this topic at the end of uh, my presentation. So in sample collection, we have a sample collection. In sample collection, we take two uh, 
uh, one is uh, sternum bone. Generally, we receive gen uh, sternum bone that was collected by uh, forensic doctors uh, or a pathologist. And second is uh, we receive a water sample that is control water uh, that is collected by an investigation officer from the water body in which that body was found. And uh, in the procedure, um, in, this is called the acid digestion method. In this method, uh, we take a sternum bone and we, cast, and we make a small pieces. And to this pieces, we add uh, uh, nitric acid and leave it for uh, overnight. Uh, the bone, when the bone is completely digested, leaving silica coated uh, diatoms undigested. The next day, distilled water is added to it and we centrifuge the sample. So we discard the supernatant and add uh, uh, to the sediment, we'll add uh, distilled water again. Uh, like that, we add two, three times uh, um, with the distilled water by centrifugation. When we get the clear uh, sediment, we make a smear on a slide, dry it, and observe under the microscope. So if a diatoms are observed in the sediment of the bone, then we'll consider it as a positive test, otherwise a negative test. Uh, we also look for a similar type of diatoms both in control water and bone sample. So we have uh, graded the results like this, four plus. If we observe the six to eight uh, diatoms, that is very good positive. Only three uh, diatoms, uh, I mean a three plus is uh, if, if we observe four to five diatoms, uh, that is good positive. If uh, we observe only uh, one to three diatoms, uh, that is two plus, uh, which is a weak positive. Nil diatoms is a negative test. And uh, so for, uh, uh, for my uh, study, I took a uh, known uh, three homicide cases and one uh, suicide case. So in first case, a dead body was found in water reservoir of a dam. The dead body was stuffed in a gunny bag and tied with a nylon rope at the top. So according to forensic doctor's report, there were laceration wounds on the head and forehead of the dead person. So uh, we got uh, uh, diatoms in the sternum uh, and it was a four plus gradation. And we, we have observed a, a similar type of uh, diatoms in the control sample also. In case number two, a sternum bone of a female dead body was found in a drainage pipe and the skull bone had fractures. So in this case also, uh, we observed a sternum um, diatom, uh, very good positive that is four plus gradation. Next, uh, even the control sample, control uh, water also, we have observed a similar type of uh, diatoms uh, with the same gradation. So in case number three, a sternum bone of a five years girl that was uh, found in agriculture world uh, with a head injury and higher bone fracture. So in this also, uh, we got a uh, very good positive with four plus gradation. Similarly, in the control water also, we got a four plus uh, gradation. In case number four, a sternum bone of a dead person who was died by jumping into the agriculture well water. So uh, in, in this uh, case also, in the sternum bone, we got very good uh, um, diatoms, I mean gradation, that is four plus uh, gradation, very good positive. But uh, we haven't received, uh, we, um, in this case, we have received one uh, liter of, uh, uh, one liter of control water uh, that was collected by investigation of a, sir, from the same water body in which the dead body was found. But uh, we could not detect any diatom, not even a single diatom in one liter of uh, control water. So 
uh, I feel these are the points to be considered uh, uh, when we uh, um, when we conduct this uh, when we um, apply this method uh, for um, observing for uh, so I'm sorry uh, for observing or uh, for um, for analysis of uh, diatoms uh, test. So according to biologists, uh, diatoms are present in all water bodies and dam places. Uh, but in my observation, in few agriculture borewell water, diatoms were not present, uh, from uh, which farmers fetch water continuously for fields and also in the well water, which may dry up frequently. I also, um, I have not uh, observed, uh, I mean, I, I didn't, I couldn't uh, detect uh, any diatom even in flood, pot, flood water and hand pump uh, water and uh, temporary rainwater pits, ponds, drinking water, sumps, uh, no diatoms were observed. And diatoms were not uh, present in swimming pool water where there was a good water recycler. So, um, so um, before um, before considering uh, uh, any um, diatoms test, diatoms test whether it is a positive or not, it is important to know whether diatoms are present in that water or not. If they are present, how many diatoms are present? And also the dead body that was found in high speed currents of water like dam water, no diatoms were observed in the sternum bone of uh, many deceased persons. So it is important to consider dry drowning or a wet drowning uh, before uh, taking or uh, before taking the diatoms test as a positive or a negative. This is with a bad, because this is with a bad uh, heart conditions may die more quickly, uh, which leads to decrease in volume of uh, water inhaled. So, basing on these observations, and my opinion is, uh, diatoms test is not a confirmatory test, uh, as they are observed in the sternum bone of uh, the deceased person whose death occurred not due to drowning. Diatoms may not present in underground water bodies uh, like agriculture borewell water, hand pump water, etc. In dry drowning cases, water may not enter into the bloodstreams of the deceased due to the sudden gush of water into the heart and the lungs of uh, um, and uh, heart and lungs which may cause breathlessness and uh, persons um, may die immediately hence no diatoms may found in sternum bone of the deceased so uh, actually forensic scientists uh, need to look for a similar type of diatom both in control water and bone sample of disease to fix the crime scene but in my case in many cases we have observed the only single type of female diatoms in all nearby water bodies of the particular area so in such cases how can we fix the crime scene so that's all about diatoms any questions Yeah, I would like to ask a question. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, you have said that uh, in swimming pool, uh, if the water is uh, uh, circling uh, in a few days, then we couldn't found any diatoms. Is it uh, a concrete law? Yes. Is yes, it sir. is it completely? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. If it is, if they have a good water recycler, yes, uh, there there were no no items were found in that water uh, because we have uh, thoroughly checked uh, such water samples. Okay, then if uh, such a sort of uh, drownings occur in swimming pool, how can the diatoms test helps to 
identify and correlate with the crime scene that to the that is due to drowning and sea water or beach mortal how can you decide it yeah that's what i'm telling uh, so datum's test is a not a confirmatory test in such cases uh, uh, we cannot concretely say that the person is died uh, uh, by drowning at least uh, by forensic tests we cannot uh, tell maybe forensic doctors uh, uh, give the, the right information okay and uh, you have tell about dry drowning and wet drowning what does it mean uh, dry drowning is uh, when uh, uh, when a person is uh, drowning into the water uh, water gush gushes uh, um, into the water gushes into his uh, nostrils and uh, even uh, that water go goes into the lungs of lungs and heart of the person which cause breathlessness so because of that uh, breathlessness uh, uh, they will die immediately um, without uh, water entering into the blood stream of that person then it is called dry drowning only. yeah that is called dry drowning Uh, if, if there is a presence in sternum bone, uh, the similar types of diatoms, similar hmm. types of diatoms are found in the sternum bone and the controlled blood sample, uh, the water sample. Then you can conclude it that it is hundred percent drowning. Uh, no, um, by my observation, that's what I'm telling. No, we cannot say because uh, in rural area of uh, uh, India, many people drink water. um with a pu not a purifier water they just drink drink without the purification so maybe uh, there is a chance of accumulation of diatoms in their uh, bodies uh, in our bodies too we have diatoms in our sternum bone yeah, that's what that's what i'm telling i have observed many uh, homicide uh, suicide and accidental death cases in which uh, i have observed uh, many diatoms uh, in uh, even in sternum bone of the deceased person okay thank you thank you madishi you went yes sir any more questions no thanks okay thank you so much uh, madhutri that was really excellent presentation thank you, thank you so much Okay, our next speaker is Dr. Laura G. Petler. She is a forensic criminologist and a private death in investigator. And I request uh, Dr. Laura to start her presentation. Uh, please, uh, please unmute yourself and start. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, great. Um, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you this morning. My name is Dr. Laura Petler. I'm a forensic criminologist from Monroe, North Carolina in the United States. This morning, I'm going to present on the murder room, scientific death investigation methodology. And because the time is so short, this is going to be like the 30,000 foot view of this uh, murder room method. So let me just try to get this pulled up on the screen here. Um, why won't it? Uh, one second, it's not showing me. Okay. Okay. Let me minimize that. Okay. So this morning I am presenting on the murder room. The murder room is a scientific multidisciplinary victim centered approach that helps resolve lots of issues law enforcement runs into today in solving death cases for manner of death. Also the murder room solves for staged or normal scenes. So it will determine both of those for us as well. The murder room is comprised of lots of parts and is systematic. And so I'm going to go over them just a very, very brief overview as we move through the system. The first thing that 
I want you to know is that science is very, very important when it comes to solving homicide cases. In the United States specifically, we have anywhere from 14 to 16,000 homicides per year, and at least 6,000 of those, more or less, go unsolved. So we're only getting clearance in about 60%, and that's very, very low. One of the reasons that I would argue why we are not doing as well as we could be doing is because there's no method being used in most cases. They're being investigated from the death scene outward, and in doing so, they become very suspect-centered as opposed to being victim-centered. And so it's very, very difficult to solve murders when they're victim-centered. Most of the time, I think people are looking for this, this smoking gun. And in my opinion, the real smoking gun is actually forensic victimology. The more that you know about the victim, the more you will know about your crime scene, the more you will understand about how the victim became a victim, and the more you will understand how the victim became the subject of violent crime if in cases of violent crime. In other ways, the, the murder room is very good for us too because sometimes when someone is charged with a crime, homicide or a felony murder, something related to death, we can put the case through the murder room and sometimes it actually shows that the wrong person is charged. So as much as it may develop probable cause for an arrest in a death case, it also can exonerate or it can exculpate people who are not guilty, who are innocent of crimes that they may have been accused of. So it's very, very important. When we use a scientific, systematic method, it minimizes investigator bias. There's no possible way that we can ever remove 100% of investigator bias because we are all human beings, we all have different experiences. We all come from various places in the world. We grew up different ways. All of that we carry with us around in our lives, but also into our investigations. And with that said, the only way to minimize it is to use a scientific method that's mostly quantitative or even purely quantitative to remove all of that ambiguity and the insertion of any kind of, em of emergent process from the investigator as they, as they continue on with the investigation. This method, the murder room, I coined the term the murder room because that's what it meant to me. And it's really a system, scientific, multidisciplinary, victim-centered, system of different apps. And that's what I call them. They're apps within an operating system. And I'm going to show you how that works. When we have suspect-centered investigations and they are not systematic, they are not multidisciplinary, they most often go cold. That is why most of these go cold because investigators are not looking for someone who, um, they are not looking at doing the victimology within the first 48 hours. At Laura Petler and Associates Death Investigations, we recommend victimology to be completed within the first 24 to 48 hours after a death. By doing that, it helps to ensure that investigators will know and understand a lot of aspects about the victim. For example, studying the victim's lifestyle is very, very important knowing what the victim did on a daily basis, understanding the routine activities. What time did the victim get up in the morning? What time did the victim go to work? What time did the victim leave for lunch? Where did the victim have lunch? Where did the, where did the victim normally go after work? Did the victim go to the gym? Did the victim go to Starbucks, McDonald's? What is it? You know, wherever that is. And studying the routine activities of that victim can oftentimes lead to the suspect. But by studying the victim's lifestyle, we automatically and in very fast time 
get clues about who the victim might have encountered. Murder doesn't happen in a vacuum. Murder is conflict resolution for the offender. In most cases, specifically di- in, in most cases, specifically domestic violence related cases, there is in 100% of all the staged murders that we've ever studied preceding conflict in the victim offender relationship. Therefore, it's very, very ex- important to study the victim and to move away from this antiquated, outdated, very, very useless suspect centered model because it is very detrimental to the overall solving and clearing of murder cases. Form follows function in the murder room. So the way that the murder room is formed, the way that it's structured, it is to increase its functionality. It's structurally sound. It's built on an operating system. And every single piece of the murder room, just like the puzzle piece you see here, they intricately fit together. They're all interrelated, even though they're individual parts. Our system determines our outcome. If we don't use the proper system for the job, it's arguable that we could lose the game, for example. So if you take a hammer and you try to change your tire on your car, it's not going to work. That's not the tool that you should use to change a tire. If a mechanic tries to change a tire with a hammer, I would argue that even a mechanic would fail because that is not the way that you change a tire. It's not the system that you use. In other words, when it comes to murder, when it comes to death and investigating suspicious deaths, we have to look at the circumstances and all of the parameters of the death itself and of the victim and then select the right system in order to investigate that. The same is true for medicine. If someone has something wrong with their foot, they don't go to the heart doctor. They go to the podiatrist. Selecting the right tools and the right experts to assist in murder cases is very much the right way to go. In the United States, we have lots of experts in various different things and, of course, throughout the world. But law enforcement is very closed off to using experts in many ways. A unification of the private sector experts combined with the American law enforcement and the government would greatly yield tremendous results towards increasing solvability and clearance. The difference between solvability and clearance is very, very stark. Clearance is the ability to make an arrest in a case. Maybe it's a conviction in a case. Maybe it's a, a charge and even a civil case for wrongful death. Solvability is very different. It's the ability for us to identify the correct suspect. The murder room gets us to that place where we can identify the correct suspect. Even if we start out with 30 suspects, we can whittle it down and pare it down to maybe even getting down to three. And then of those three, who is the most, most likely suspect? Sometimes in those cases, it doesn't develop enough probable cause for arrest or clearance, but at least it can help law enforcement get closer to solvability, the ability to identify the correct suspect in a death investigation. So take a look at what the murder room looks like. This is the overall. And I know that when you look at it, it looks like some crazy diagram that might not make any sense, but it actually makes a lot of sense. And we use this in a physical room at Laura Petler and Associates headquarters. And as you can see in the center, there's an operating system. The operating system is critical to observe first because it's where everything operates from. It's just like your phone. When you have your phone, you have to download the operating system. You have to update the operating system and you have to keep it in tip top shape. If you do not update the operating system of your phone, you cannot use all the apps. You cannot download apps. You can't open them. You cannot use them. They don't work and they don't yield the results that you're looking for. So as you notice here, there's all of these green arrows in the murder room. That means that this is your path. All of these arrows symbolize your path. So when we're going down through here, 
just very quickly to understand the operating system. There's three stages in the blue, two stages in the red, and one stage in the, in the purple. The murder room is a six-stage system that helps you investigate death, wrongful death, homicide, suspicious death. The first stage is knowledge. Knowledge is when we're just getting ready to know the victim. In 1956, Benjamin Bloom said that all people learn by a series of cognitive domains, and you can't do anything until you have knowledge. I agree with them. So stage one is knowledge of Bloom's taxonomy, Benjamin Bloom's phenomenal cognitive domain taxonomy that I use literally for everything at this point. The second stage is comprehension. That means we take the knowledge that we learn and then we work to comprehend it or understand it. From there, we try to apply it. So if you're looking at a paintbrush and you dip it in a bucket of paint and then you take the brush and you brush it across a wall, you just figure it out. Okay, first, this is paint. This is a brush. I dip it into the can and then I wipe it onto the wall or brush it onto the wall and it makes a painted wall. Okay, I understand how what the knowledge is. I understand the application of it and I can successfully do that. Once you have finished painting your wall, the next stage in Benjamin Bloom's taxonomy is called analysis. Then you stand back and you look at your wall and you're looking at it. Okay, do I need a little bit more paint here? Did I need less paint here? Do I need to go over the edges again? You're analyzing all of your painting skills and looking how to see your wall looks. Stage five is synthesis. That's when you'll synthesize the whole wall together. So now you've got wall one painted, wall two painted, wall three and wall four. And as you look around, you synthesize all of the walls and the paint job together and then go back to stage four and see if you need to analyze any other aspect of it and then paint it again. Stage six is evaluation. That's when you stand back and look at your work. You evaluate it. Did I do a great job painting? Did I do a poor job painting? Do I need to learn more? Do I understand how to paint? And as you notice, the first three set, th first three stages are blue. The next two stages are red. And when you com combine red and blue, you get purple. Stage six is the evaluation stage. So going back to the murder room diagram, the first thing we're going to do when we walk onto a crime scene is we're going to ask who's in conflict with the victim, who discovered the victim, and who called 911. That's called Petler Staging Trilogy. And if investigators will do just that, just even that simple trilogy, they're ahead of the game. We take that trilogy and we plug it into stage one and we move it into staging taxonomy, which is over here on the bottom right. That's Petler staging taxonomy. It's something new that I just came up with this year, and I'm very, very excited about it. From the staging taxonomy, we can then take staging behaviors and divide them into three categories, linguistic, visual, and nonverbal. And when we do that, it helps us understand everything that we're getting in the scene and, and, if they're and if the behaviors we're getting from a suspect or a witness may be consistent with staging. From there, we go to the victim. We study the victim. We're going to study everything about the victim from lifestyle to medical history to education to intimate partners. And then we plug it back into comprehension and move into application. Once we move into application, we study the victimology and we sort everything. If we, when we use Petler's modified triangulation method, using the, the edu, using the ethical constructs for empirical research of validity and reliability. We can then assign anything that we can prove in the courtroom where it's valid and reliable as green. If it's partially valid or partially reliable, something that we learned about the victim, we can assign yellow. And things that we hear about the victim, but we can't, we can't prove that empirically, we do, we assign that red in the color in the murder room, put that on the wall in red because we don't have anything that validates it or makes it reliable. 
once we finished with the sus once we finished with the victim we then move into the analysis model the first thing we do in the analysis model is the suspectology we run the suspectology the exact same way we run victimology and then we run it back through the triangulation so everything we learn about the suspect we then also categorize as green yellow or red on the victim on the murder room walls we then study the autopsy and we bring in consulting experts in case that there are things that the round table, the specific round table at headquarters cannot address. We do wound pattern analysis. We study EMT reports and medical records. We then compare that back to the victimology and the suspectology. The next piece is the crime lab and the crime reports and the crime scene. We analyze everything. We break all of it apart. The log notes, the evidence logs, the measurements, the sketch, the tests and the results. We analyze each piece individually, and then we compare it back to the autopsy, the suspectology, and the victimology. Then we do that for the same with the witnesses. Some witnesses we categorize as critical witnesses. They contain information that prosecutors will use to put on the stand and present the case. Some witnesses then are categorized in white noise. White noise means that they're just trying to, they're not critical to the case, meaning that the information they have doesn't help the prosecutor prove his or her theory. At that point, sometimes we need to do a crime scene reconstruction. We do that with shooting reconstruction, or we do that with bloodstain reconstruction, or both. We need all of those other pieces that you see below, the victimology, suspectology, autopsy, crime scene, and witnesses, all to do the crime scene reconstruction using the scientific method. It's the seven-stage seven step method that everybody uses universally. Moving into synthesis, we move over here to stage five where we map and understand all of the relationships between the geography. Once we finish doing that, we then put up this critical timeline and you can see from this graphic that there's different pieces for different people. The time always goes in the middle. And then we use the color blue for the victim and critical witnesses go in white. The suspect is always goes in, in red, possible suspects and accomplice, accomplices go in pink, orange, and peach. So what you can see, what you can see is that you can see all these gaps of time that you need to account for. You can see when the victim died, it makes no other purposeful movement. Then you can see where everybody else comes in and out. Once we synthesize all the rest of these pieces, we move into the suspect interview matrix where we interview people in the field. Anybody in the green zone is okay to talk to. They won't tip off the suspect that we're coming. Anyone in the yellow zone, we're not sure. And so we make sure that we are very careful about interviewing those people. The suspect and all the suspects, immediate people, like the spouse or the parents, the children, best friends, we interview them all at the same time. And so we are very, very strategic when we're investigating both cold cases and hot cases when it comes to interview matrices. We then use something called Petler's Conflict Resolution Benefit. Who's in conflict with the victim? How does murder resolve that conflict? And in column three, we list all of the ways that the offender benefits from the victim's death. Then we use something called the before, during, and after matrix, which summarizes for an, a jury or for a prosecutor to help get toward prosecutorial theory and strategy. The last thing is the event synthesis matrix, which summarizes every single piece that we've gone over here. It culminates into a very, very large report that reads like a six chapter dissertation that, we, that, that our clients get from LPA. Most of the time, they're well over 150 pages, and it contains all the opinions of all of the experts that have weighed in, all the analysis of every single part from every single stage of analysis, the entire victimology, plus at least probably 15 different appendices. So that's how the murder room works, and this is a very, very quick overview of it, but I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have about it. Um, if I can at this time. Um, good morning, Domingo. I was just looking at your, um, looking at the chat. 
Yes, I am a criminologist and, and an author for the Journal of Security and Justice. And yes, Domingo, thank you for posting that, that last article. Thank you, Martina. I appreciate the, the compliment that it was an interesting argue, article. Thank you, Dion. Uh, Dr. Laura, can I ask a question? Dr. Laura, myself, Dr. Rakhi Khanna. Can you hear me? I'm trying to move everybody back over here. 10 15. Yeah, yeah. Uh, kind, kindly uh, put some light on this, please, Madam Dr. Laura. Please put some light on this the staging. <clears throat> So the staging taxonomy is something I've been working on for probably 20 years. And earlier this year, I had a situation that finally one Wednesday morning, I woke up and this was in my head. And I'm so excited about it because for years I've been working all these murder cases and I've been calling it crime scene staging. And really I've taken it up to a macro level and gotten rid of the words crime scene staging. And now at LPA, we use the word staging. Monolithic or polylithic, I'm sorry, monothematic or polythematic means that stagers can either choose to stage a death scene in one way or in the polythematic ways where they use lots of things. If they do a, polo, a monothematic crime scene or a crime, they're only going to pick one thing from either one of these categories, linguistic, visual, nonverbal. If they choose polythematic, something that shows us a bit more sophistication, potentially, maybe a higher level of mixed level organization in the scene or in the crime overall, they pick and choose from all these different categories. When you take the the case of Jody Arias, for example, she's a killer from Arizona who killed her boyfriend or ex-boyfriend, Travis Alexander. What's interesting about Arias is that you can take this staging taxonomy and look at the linguistic staging things that, that are categorized under minor, moderate, or major. Minor staging is actually much more difficult to distinguish and identify when it comes to linguistics because we as investigators might not know what's being concealed. Moderate and major linguistic staging is actually much easier to detect because major linguistic staging completely departs from the reality of the scene. So, I mean, you might have a gunshot wound victim, but the offender is telling you that the victim is stabbed to death and you're like, that's completely you know, wrong. It takes a long time to explain this taxonomy, but linguistic staging comes in three types, minor, moderate, and major. And then it breaks down into verbal linguistic staging and written linguistic staging. Lin written linguistic staging also includes digital staging, which includes text messages and cyber staging in social media. We have a lot of people who cyber stage all kinds of things from being victims of accidents to faking illnesses to faking murders and to faking being murder victims or having fake murder victims in their family. Um, all of those are related to the oral tone, the tone, the idiolect, the word choice, the sentence and the structure. All of those are oral aspects of linguistics. And once I realized that staging was in essence the form of communication that the offender was trying to use in order to communicate with law enforcement to avoid apprehension and to self-preserve, to definitely stay free so he or she could benefit. Right. Yeah. Thank you. So, so much for you're very welcome. I the visual it. staging is the same. You know, you can subtract, add, or destroy things from crime scenes. And the spatiality, the arrangement, occupancy, and use of space is very important. 
the nonverbal staging, what's there and what's not there, how the offender or how the suspect sits across from you. Do they cross their arms? Do they look directly at you? Do they touch you? Are they covering up our artifacts where they may have been injured in their hands or something during the attack? All of those things are very, very important. So this taxonomy has been extremely helpful to us and it will be published in my upcoming book. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Laura, for a wonderful uh, presentation from your side in knowledge in a very uh, brief uh, poster manner uh, that touches me because I'm also touching the same aspect, but in Indian scenario. So it is of a uh, different uh, sort completely. So it helps me to uh, further uh, make us contact more and coordinate more to help. Yes, uh, thank you. To take help of your uh, perception in Indian uh, uh, aspect uh, yes so yeah, i appreciate very, very that nice i to interact with you very nice. oh it's very nice to interact with you too and i'm glad that you like it and we have a very high rate of solvability we have about a 98 percent solvability rate with the murder room uh, uh the conviction rate in the cases of crimes uh there at usa uh, how much is the uh, percentage of the conviction of such uh, possibility of positivity of the cases uh, you know, I don't know the most recent statistics for conviction rates because it varies so much with um, if people take a plea. We were actually just talking about that yesterday. What is the what is the solvability rate versus the actual clearance rate or conviction right now? I can tell you overall it's very low, but I do not know the specific statistics or if ever, anyone's even studying that specifically. And uh, what specific sort of investigator on attending a crime scene you need to approach in the first instance? First instance, when you approach to a crime scene, how many investigators you need to take with yourself? At the um, I think that all the different agencies do it, you know, differently. I think the first responders are always the ones to respond. They're not, they're not detectives. They're not experts at least one detective should go to a scene like that, but not everybody does. You know, sometimes people do, some people don't. Sometimes in these suicide cases, the first responders just chalk it up as suicide and they don't actually call detectives or call crime scene even to come in and review the scene or investigate the scene. And they just assume the integrity, which is the biggest problem for us, when, when investigators, first responders, EMS, 911 call operator, when they assume the integrity of a 911 call and the content on the 911 call, or assume the integrity of the position of the body, assume the integrity of the scene overall, that is the most detrimental thing to us right off the bat because we're losing opportunity to use Petler's trilogy which asks three questions when you get out of your car at the crime scene. Who is in conflict with this victim? Who discovered the victim? And who called 911? If you're positive on one or two points of the three, I would move forward in treating the death as a suspicious death until otherwise you figure it out that it may not be. Thank you. Thank you so much. Nice you're welcome. Thank you so nice much. to interact with you all too. Thank you for having me today. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Laura. That was really an excellent presentation. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You all have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Moving on, our uh, next speaker is uh, Diane Watson. She's from Crime Scene Assist Limited, United Kingdom. And I request uh, Diane Watson to start her presentation. Hi, everyone. I'm going to the presentation. Can you see that okay? Uh, yes, we can see it. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. So, good afternoon, everyone. My name's Dion Watson. And just to start, I'd just like to say a very quick thank you to the Scientific Guild for asking me to speak at the second Global Forensic webinar. It's a, it's a real honour to be here. 
Um, so I'm from a company called Crime Scene Assist. And some of you might remember my business partner, Angela Davies, who spoke at the first global forensic web webinar. Um, Angela spoke on behalf of our company and she discussed forensic awareness for the first responder. And as part of her presentation, she briefly discussed a new app, Crime Scene Assistant, that we have brought to market last June it was. So I just want to build on that a little bit and I'm going to demonstrate the app Crime Scene Assistant and highlight some of its benefits as a sustainable accessible tool that's at the user's fingertips. Uh, just before I start, I'd just like to give you a bit of a background about myself and where, where I've came from, why I'm talking here today. So I began my journey within the forensic arena back in 2005 whilst I was studying on a crime scene science degree at Teesside University in the northeast of England. Um, once I graduated from the university, I went to work for Northumbria Police as a CSI. And as a crime scene investigator, I worked in a busy city centre and I attended all types of crime scenes. So from volume crime scenes such as burglaries and thefts, all the way up to serious category crime such as murder, robbery, rape, arson, all those sort of things. Whilst working as a CSI, I also undertook some specialist training, including things like fire investigation. And I also took part in a specialist exercise called Exercise Satan Force, which is a joint military and police um, bomb disposal exercise, which also looks at post-explosive scene management. I also work as a mass fatality. No problem. So I started my first business, CSI training and events in 2012 when I left, left the police. And I started that with my business partner who I've met. Oh, hello, Diane. And crime scene investigation, training and events to a multitude of audiences. The business has been successfully running for just over nine years now. Um, it has won a few awards and we've also delivered our events both nationally and internationally. But in 2019, we decided that we wanted to break out our professional training from some of the events that we do. And we also decided that we would like to say, take some of our training online and produce it digitally. So in 2019, we started our digital sister company, Crime Scene Assist Limited. The main aim of Crime Scene Assist Limited is to make forensic awareness second nature for the first responder. And that's something that both myself and Angela feel really passionate about. And that's because of the experiences that we've had throughout our careers. And it's coming across that the age old problem that we have of crime scene contamination. So there's only one opportunity to recover evidence, forensic evidence. And if it's lost or destroyed or contaminated in the first instance, then unfortunately that cannot be rectified and we cannot get that evidence back. So therefore it's really imperative that anybody who is attending and interacting with crime scenes has a basic knowledge and understanding of their environment and that they can make a substantive effort to maintain crime scene integrity. But despite this, a lot of first responders and other professionals who encounter forensic evidence as part of their job role don't always receive adequate forensic awareness training. Um, they also don't know when, when they're attending a crime scene, well, any scene, they don't know potentially if it is gonna turn out to be a crime scene or not. So what's the solution to this problem of crime scene contamination? For us, we believe that the solution is increasing knowledge and awareness amongst those first line responders. 
So how, how can we do that? There's obviously a number of different ways that we can do it. And that includes training and practice. However, these issue, the issue around this is often for organisations is the affordability of it and also making sure that the information that's been given to the first responders is consistent across the board. And we believe that Crime Scene Assistant is really helping to solve those problems. So what is Crime Scene Assistant? It's a forensic awareness app that's been designed to be used as a scene aid memoir and a learning tool that can either be used on the scene as a quick reference guide when it's appropriate, or as a learning tool and revision guide to be used at any time when, when it's needed by the, the user. It can also, and has been used as a training tool. So who is the app for? Who have we designed it for? It's been developed for anyone who has the potential to be the first in attendance at a crime scene such as the, the primary first responders we all think of, such as police officers, paramedics, fire officers, but also including security officers, pest controllers, so those other people who potentially come across crime scenes as part of their job role. It's also really useful for any students of those, of those professions that we've just mentioned, but it's also really useful for students of crime scene and forensic investigation courses as well. So basically the app is a, an affordable solution that fills a knowledge gap and it provides a step-by-step -step guide to approaching and preserving crime scenes and the evidence within them. And it has tailored information for each of those first responders. So before I go any further, I'm going to show you a short demonstration video of the app. So hopefully you can hear this okay. Today's video, I'm demonstrating the app being used on an Apple device. There will be some small differences on the Android, such as the location of the back arrows, but everything else will pretty much up and function as you'll see here. I'm not going to go into all the for all of the responders. I'm also going to know how it works and the sort of information you can expect to see within it. When you open the app for the first time, to see a mode pop up, you'll need to read and agree to this before you can begin to use the app. This will only occur on your first use, so once you've agreed it, you won't see it again. Because I've used the app previously, it hasn't popped up for me to demonstrate to you today. If you do want to revisit the term conditions at any point, you can find them within the more section. So in the bottom right hand side of the corner, if you press here, you can see we can now see conditions. If you click through, you can see we have more information here. Each of those boxes, if when you click, you can see it's expanded and gives much more information about each of the settings that we've clicked in. After you've agreed to the disclaimer, the home page will be displayed for you. You'll see here we'll open the app down into four responder categories police, medic, fire, and others. The reason for this is because the content within each of those sections has been appropriately tailored to that particular service. You'll also notice that we've color-coded each responder category to make it clear which section you were in when you were using the app. From the home page, you need to select which of the services you are from. Other responders have been created to professionals such as security officers, bouncers, few robbers, controllers, search and rescue, etc. So basically those professionals who discover crime scenes and often inadvertently find themselves first in attendance. Upon choosing your service, you'll go through to a processes page. Thereafter, upon closing and reopening the app, as you can see here, I bypass the home page and return to the process page. This will happen each time to make getting directly to the information you require that little bit quicker. If for any reason you've selected the wrong service or you just want to look at the other section of the app reference, you can use the back arrow to navigate back to the home page. 
on Apple, you can find this in the bottom left corner. And on an Android device, you'll find this in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. The process page is the page you'll see first in each of the services. The information on here is presented as a step by step guide on how to deal with the crime scene. And this is where the information starts to become tailored for each of the services, as you can see here. For today's demonstration, I'll use the Medic section. Each of the process steps are accessible to you individually, so that you can just select the information that's relevant to you. For example, you might be confident on how to approach a crime scene, but you need some advice on how to preserve a piece of evidence. In which case, you could jump straight into step two. Throughout the app, we've tried to put down the information into digestible chunks. We use drop-downs and click-throughs to deliver further information. For example, here you can see a plus icon. This indicates a drop-down, and when we click it, the information will expand and deal further points to note. You can also see that the icon has now turned to a minus. When you click that again, it will minimise the information. Right is indicated by a forward facing arrow. So you can see that here, priority one, preserve Dean. When you click that arrow, it will take you through to a page that contains further information and often new menus too. When you've finished, you can navigate back to where you were before using the back arrow. In addition to the bite sized chunks of information we've supplied, there are also very quick and easy to use checklists to help you keep track of your actions. So, for example, in step three documentation, you'll see there's a reminder list of the facts you should be recording at any scene. Ensuring you note these points will also help you later with your statement writing and any court presentation that you need to give. Once you have a specific fact, you can click that box and you will see that it places a little tick within it. It's important to note that in some of the checklists, it will also have a drop down button. If it has a drop down, it will show as a plus icon. In the app. Yes, that it will give you additional information about the specific point that you already look at. It will click. It will click the checklist in exactly the same way that this does. It's also important to note that the app will do all of this information for you. So if you need to go away and deal with something else and come back to this at a later point, when you reopen it you'll see that the app has stored all of that information, so you will not use it. When it comes up with your finished checklist and you want to clear it ready for the next use, you can just use the click, click the refresh button in the right hand corner. When you click this, it will give you a clear pop window, basically just checking that you do want to clear it and you can press that by accident. So if you are ready to go ahead and clear them, you can just press yes, and you can see now it clears the list and gives you a new one ready to run through again. Most of the information in the app is available offline and hence it's accessible anyway. Apart from two links that we consider to be very important, but they are specific to UK responders. These are the links to give you information on base code D for the police, and they find local sexual assault referral centres. Currently, the app is designed for individual use on personal handsets. We'll be continuing to develop and the app moving forward. In the future, we'll also be licensing to individual organisations. This will mean full customization of the app to be utilised on organisational handsets. Hope that that demonstration has been useful to you. And thank you for listening.
Brilliant. So hopefully you could see from that demonstration that the app has quite a lot of useful information within it. Um, we believe it's a fantastic digital tool and it's always available at the user's fingertips and there are many benefits to the user to using it. In addition, it can also be used in both practical and virtual environments, which it has been done by a number of UK universities at the moment. It also, it helps to offer a uniformity in knowledge and understanding across different frontline services. And it helps those services who are struggling with capacity in terms of training, which is quite a bit of feedback that we're getting at the moment from different organizations. It's really easy to navigate and it's accessible offline, as it said in the demonstration, which means it's really resilient as once it's been downloaded, it doesn't need an internet connection to access the information within. So as a result, it can be utilized anytime and in all different types of environments. It's also a great training tool. be a good thing. In an ideal world, what the Crime Scene Assist team are trying to promote is that forensic awareness training should be embedded into the initial training of all first responders with the hope that it becomes second nature to them. So rather than when they turn up at the crime scene, it being just another thing that they have to think about, it just becomes automatically integrated into part of their practice. But we're a long way from that yet, and we have to start somewhere. And the app, we believe, is a, is a great place to start. In addition, the app is sustainable as we will be maintaining it and updating it on a regular basis as well. But one of the most important things about it is it's really cost effective. It won't break the bank and it will add real value to staff training and improving the, the proper handling of crime scenes from the word go which will have an extremely in positive impact on not only the CSIs and the forensic scientists, but other, other investigators and the criminal justice system as a whole. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how well trained your scientists and your CSIs are, if the first attending officer attends and if they're not conscious of the environment they're working in, or if they've not received appropriate forensic awareness training, they can and unfortunately do contaminate or destroy vital evidence prior to the CSI being able to arrive and recover it. So the other great thing about the app is that it's really accessible and it can be acquired in a number of different ways. So firstly, indiv individuals can purchase it for themselves for their own continuing professional development through the app stores. So it's available both on the Google Play Store and the iOS Apple App Store. And it's available for the price of 6 99 that's Great British Pounds. So it's less than the price of a textbook, quite, quite considerably less than a textbook. And secondly, rather than individuals purchasing it themselves, the app can also be bought in bulk directly from us. So through a licensing agreement, we mentioned that in the demonstration, but we have actually very quickly um, brought that about because it was something that we had a lot of inquiries about. So we worked quite fast on bringing a licensed version to market and that is available now. So organizations can buy that in bulk for their employees and they'll receive a discount for doing that. And the process is really, really simple if anybody's interested then you can get in touch but essentially um, once you've decided how many licenses that you would like for an organization and we've been informed we draw up an agreement and an invoice um, once that's been dealt with and then we've been sent the we'll send over the information for signing um, then we receive a list of email addresses of the users and once we have that we set that up and then we'll contact the users to give them their unique login information. So it's a really simple process. And thirdly and lastly, we also are offering a white label 
product, which is to help suit individual organization needs. So within this, we can add the logo for the organization. We can remove all the other content. So for example, if it was a police force buying it, we can move, remove the fire section and the, the medic section if they would like. Um, and we can also add things that are really important to that organization as a whole. And you can see some of the examples of that on the images on the screen. So things like your standard operating procedures, if you have any ISO protocols, they're coming into force at the moment. So that's a really handy thing to have in there. Um, but essentially, there's lots of different ways that we can white label it, but we would work with the organisations as individuals to see what, what's going to be the best for them, and what's going to hit their organisational needs. But regardless of whichever option that people decided to access the app, we're here to assist every step of the way. And also, it's a, it's a one-off fee to buy in the app as it is, and it won't become a subscription product or anything like that. And so if anyone wants to know any more have it, uh, wants to know any more about that, please just feel free to get in touch. The email address is at the bottom there. Um, but just before I finish this afternoon, I just wanted to share with you some of our other plans moving forward. So we've been listening really intently to the feedback that we've been receiving from our users since launch, and we take that really seriously. So we want to continue to improve the app and we have some updates that will be coming out very soon. There's also going to be a big change in the police section as we're adding even more information about the sexual offences section and we think that'll help significantly when that gets gets added as well. We're also in the midst of developing specialist add-ons where we'll be looking at subject specific material so things such as firearms, CBRN attacks, terrorist incidents etc. And as we mentioned, there is the white labeling, as we've previously mentioned. And we are also developing some online training modules to build upon and support the information in the app and vice versa. So they'll, they'll be to help each other with that. So I hope that's been useful and informative to you. So thank you everyone for listening. Um, if anyone wants to connect, if you, you can scan that QR code there and it will connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, but other than that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Thank you for the excellent presentation. Thank you. And, uh, uh, just, uh, just a minute. Uh, uh, I'm uh, okay. Just share Our the... next speaker is uh, Dr. Swati Kumareswar from JSS Dental College and Hospital India. And she's going to give a presentation on Introduction to Humanitarian Forensics. And I request Dr. Swati to start her presentation. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, very greetings of the day to all the members of the panel and uh, the audience who have joined us today for the conference. Just give me a minute, I will just share the screen. Yes. I would like to thank uh, the Global Scientific Guild as well for giving me this opportunity to be part of this panel. Hope my screen is visible. Yes, yes, yes. Please continue. Uh, so uh, I am uh, Dr. Swati Kumareshwar, and uh, I'm a lecturer and course coordinator for MSc Forensic Orientology program at the JSS Academy of Higher Education and Research in India. Uh, today, I want to talk about the introduction uh, to humanitarian forensics. Before I go into the topic, I would like to um, mention about how I shift, I wouldn't say shifted um, my interest to humanitarian forensics from odontology, but how I developed an interest into humanitarian forensics. Um, uh, in 2018, I did have a opportunity to attend the International Conclave of Humanitarian Forensics organized by the ICRC in 2018. And this, I have developed a passion and interest to work towards humanitarian aid, providing humanitarian aid. And in 2019, uh, I feel like I was blessed and also lucky to have a summer internship opportunity at the Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency for a period of two months. 
Uh, it's an agency within the United States Department of Defense whose mission is to recover missing personnel who are listed as prisoners of war or missing in action from all past wars and conflicts and from countries around the world. Working with the DPAA made me realize the importance of identity and that having an identity is a human right even after death. So this experience was a pivotal moment for me to want to further pursue humanitarian principles. Uh, these are pictures from DPAA. This little girl there is me. Um, the humanitarian forensic action. The term humanitarian forensic action was first coined by the International Committee of the Red Cross ICRC. It is defined as the application of forensic science to humanitarian activities. So what we all know what forensic science is, but what are the humanitarian activities? Humanitarian action refers to a range of activities that seek to alleviate human suffering and protect the dignity of all victims of armed conflict and catastrophes carried out free of charge and framed under the international humanitarian law. Forensic science in general is being perceived to be associated only with the criminal investigations, identification of the offenders, and is also known to play a vital role in the criminal justice delivery system. But there is also exists, but there also exists a compassionate form of this forensic science that has emerged most recently, and that is humanitarian forensics. By the term itself, it can be understood as an exclusive expertise associated with the humanitarian services or actions. Humanitarian principles are rooted in both the international humanitarian law and practice. They provide the foundation for humanitarian action in the field and are critical for distinguishing humanitarian actors from other actors gaining acceptance for humanitarian presence and operations in crisis settings and enabling humanitarian access to populations in need, as well as the security of humanitarian personnel and their beneficiaries. So there are essentially four humanitarian principles that guide the humanitarian response during armed conflict and disasters. Humanity, human suffering must be addressed whether it is for the purpose of humanitarian action is to promote life and health and ensure respect of whole human beings. Somehow, at the exclusion of other principles, having to do with their rights, their environment, their family, their tribes, their nation, nationalism, and patriot patriotism. The point here is how humanitarian action has to focus its attention on maintaining life, preserving life, and the dignity of the population. The second principle is neutrality. Neutrality is about not taking side to the hostilities. It is a form of guarantee of impartiality. Sorry, I think I missed the second principle is impartiality. Humanitarian action must be carried out on the basis of need alone, giving priority to the most urgent cases of distress and making no distinctions on the basis of nationality, race, gender, religious beliefs, class, or political opinions. To achieve this goal, this assistance and protection must focus on the most vulnerable group and their highest needs. The third principle is neutrality. Neutrality is about not taking sides to the hostilities. It's a form of guarantee of impartiality. By not taking sides, you guarantee that you, your assistance is strictly impartial and purely humanitarian. And finally, independence. The principle of independence is that action must be autonomous from the political, economic, military, or other objectives that any actor may hold with regard to areas where humanitarian action is being implemented. This principle is not so much an absolute principle that you should not have any dependencies. On the contrary, you have a lot of dependencies personally and institutionally, dependencies with donors, with constituents, with stakeholders, and so forth. So these are the four humanitarian principles that provide the, the guarantee that when you operate in a very sensitive environment, such as a battlefield or a conflict area, you can claim to be humanitarian. You can hope to be perceived as neutral and impartial as the way you can have access to populations affected by hostilities in real time. 
Humanity should never be negotiated. Humanitarian emergencies today have reached unprecedented dimensions and proportions. As the need for humanitarian aid grows, there is a growing recognition of the role of forensic science to play in addressing the needs of affected people in, humanity, in the humanitarian sphere. People go missing during wars, natural disasters, and migration. In such conditions, there is a necessity of locating, identifying the dead victims, rendering critical health care to the victims affected with morbidity, providing reassurance to the victims and their relatives, dignified management of the dead and the rituals with their respective cultural context. Comprehensive and prudent management of the victims involves the psychosocial, sociocultural, healthcare, scientific identification, and social security aspects. A priority of forensic science in the humanitarian space is the dignified management of the deceased and the re resolution of missing cases. The identification of individuals is a priority as families have the right to know the whereabouts and the fate of their relatives and the deceased, deceased have a right to the restoration of their identity after death. Driven slowly by humanitarian motives, forensic experts try to give the unidentified remains of the dead back their names and help bereaved families close a painful chapter. Humanitarian forensics provides the necessary tools and expertise to manage this. Forensic medicine, forensic anthropology, archeology, span forensic odontology, and geneticists play a major role in identification, which will reunite the dead body to the identity of a person in life, so as to ensure that no one is buried as a John Doe or a Jane Doe. As forensic specialist Maria Mendes put it, when families ask you questions and you are able to provide answers, I feel I am in the right place doing the right thing. Um, regarding the deceased, the humanitarian priority should not be seen independently from the judicial aspects of international humanitarian, human rights, or criminal laws alone. The investigation in mass fatalities, whether they aim at the prosecution of perpetrators, the identification of the victims, or both depends on the collection of the same type of information, which is the excavation of data, biological profiling, pathology, and trauma analysis, et cetera. The International Criminal Court is using forensic experts for field investigation as part of the court proceedings. These experts need to provide expert evidence on instructions to the court for trials of genocide, war crimes, or crimes against humanity. The angle of approach, whether judicial or humanitarian, will depend on the mandate of the organization and influences which disciplines and specialties of forensic sciences will be used in such operations. The most important people when it comes to response to a, say, a disaster or an armed conflict, aftermath of an armed conflict, armed conflict is first responders. First responders immediately after a major disaster, identifying and uh, disposing of human remains are often done by local communities. Forensic specialists may not be available and, or unable to rapidly access the affected area. And uh, in the meantime, we'll have first responders who will include local authorities, organizations, communities, other forensic practitioners, and volunteers. These first responders are needed for the retrieval and immediate management of dead. So, and they need to act in a way that protects the dead's dignity, paves the way for future identification, ensuring traceability, respecting the bereaved, and also consoling the bereaved. And the first responders help in proper recovery, recovery of the bodies. And what steps they follow are allocation of a unique code to each body, photographing, recording data, placing each body in a body bag, temporary or long-term storage, identifying and arranging a secure burial site. They do all this until and until a forensic but can come to site and then set up a temporary morgue or temporary mortuary, and then the postmortem examinations can take place. Disaster victim identification. A disaster victim identification, um, the Interpol has given four steps 
on what are the on what we need to do when there is a huge natural disaster or um say like a plane crash the first step is sorry scene examination depending on the incident and where it happened it takes days or weeks for all the victims and their property to be recovered the second step is postmortem data collection of the postmortem data the human remains are examined by specialists to detect forensic evidence to help identify the victim this can include the primary identifiers that we all know that are the bones and teeth dna fingerprints Bones and teeth are really important because they survive and that makes them of particular importance when we have an individual and we don't know who they are. If we can take DNA off a body, we can take fingerprints off a body, we can get a good chance on identifying them. But this is not always the case because in case of a DVI or disaster victim identification, where we have mass fatalities, for example, a plane crash, the body is burnt, it's decomposed or it's skeletalized, the amount of information is obviously diminished. You know, we might not be able to get fingerprints. So our responsibility is to take that, that bone and it may only be a part of a bone. It might not be a whole skeleton and try to determine something about the identity of the individual. And there are four primary biology identifiers that we can all relate to. So we have um, sex, that is you either have a male or a female but there's also a gray area within that as well. And then there's age at which you go missing or an age at which you die. And then we have the ethnic real origin. Now that doesn't mean that where you are born, ethnic origin refers to your ancestry and then height. And other physical indications such as tattoos, scars, which are all, you know, play the role of um, identification marks, surgical implants, which may be unique to the victim, if they have any dental work done, if there's any evidence of surgery, uh, did they have a, a limp? Do they would, would, would you know would they have walked with a limp prior to death, etc. Visual identification is not so considered to be accurate. An incomplete postmortem assessment can lead to a delayed or even to a non-identification and would represent a violation to human rights and international humanitarian law. In cases where people have been violently and radically dehumanized through disembarment, either prior to or after death, forensic identification is also a practice of rehumanization after death. Then antimortem data, dental and medical records, fingerprints and DNA are recovered from the victim's homes or provided by their families, from their doctors and dentists, so on and so forth. And then the last and final step is reconciliation. That is, once the postmortem and antemortem data is collected, a team of specialists will compare and reconcile these two sets of information to identify the victims. Uh, as you can see, these forms here are the ones that are used by most of the organizations, humanitarian forensic organizations. The pink form is to collect all the postmortem data. Um, you can see the den dental charting here. And the yellow form is to collect the antemortem data. It's nearly an effective process of identification, including timely and transparent information shared with families of the deceased and the missing from conflict and their families is needed. So this is all for about uh, how we do identification at a disaster site. And if, if we're not able to you know, establish identity even after this, then the skeletal remains or the bodies recovered are sent to forensic laboratories where further tests of DNA analysis or isotope analysis, et cetera, are performed to um, determine identity. And talking about humanitarian forensic action, we have to talk about the international humanitarian law. Uh, the horrors of World War I and II in particular reinforced the need to limit suffering and armed conflicts and lead to the adoption of four Geneva Conventions of the 1949, which formed the foundation of contemporary international humanitarian law. Since then, states have negotiated and concluded other international agreements re regulating armed conflict, including three additional protocols to the Geneva Conventions and a series of weapon treaties that have expanded humanitarian protections in armed conflict. As the set of international legal rules 
that co govern situations of armed conflict and occupation, the international humanitarian law aims to strike a balance between the military necessity and the humanity. It accommodates military objectives of the battlefield while seeking to reduce human suffering in a wartime by preventing unnecessary harm to civilians and non-combatants. In doing so, it establishes a minimum set of standards for conduct during warfare. Uh, the IHL protects those who are not fighting and are no longer able to fight, such as civilians, prisoners of war, and the wounded. It requires that parties to a conflict always make a distinction between the combatants and the military targets, which may be attacked. Combatants must always observe the principle of proportionality, which limits anticipated collateral damage to civilians and civilian objects, resulting from attacks against legitimate targets. I had tell protects humanitarian act actors and operations in the conflict settings. It provides the basis for humanitarian actors to engage with parties of conflict and to gain access to affected populations in order to deliver effective humanitarian assistance during wartime. It is especially important for humanitarian actors to understand international humanitarian law since it establishes the fundamental protections for civilians and aid workers in times of armed conflict. Um, I would like to continue, but uh, I would like to conclude by saying, before I conclude, I would like to say that the Equality and the Human Rights Conventions explains human rights as the basic rights and freedom that belong to every person in the world from birth to death. So I believe that your human rights exist even before birth, that is from within the womb, till after death and even in the grave. Uh, considering the dead as equals to the living in terms of universal human rights should transcend national boundaries and the demand humanitarian funds action. Unidentified bodies can be still respected and treated with dignity, but their human rights will only be fulfilled, restored by establishing their names and identities and their places in the world. Um, Future crises cannot be predicted or prevented, but responses can always be prepared. We require more forensic, regional forensic arrangements and research to improve and more improve uh, a need to improve effectiveness in this area. And uh, in the current COVID pandemic, uh, the humanitarian forensic groups such as the ICRC, the, that is the International Committee of the Red Cross, the ICHF, the International Committee of Humanitarian Forensics and so on, have ad are adapting its existing activities and programs to ensure we can help address the growing needs globally concerning the dead, the families, and those working to protect and manage the dead. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much, Bhati. This was a really excellent presentation. Really. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, any questions for Dr. Swati? Yes, thank you, great presentation, yes. Uh, thank, thank you. Okay. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Domingo. From, he's a geographic profiling analyst from Italy, and he's going to give a presentation on is the offender predictable? The geographic profiling in investigation. And I request uh, Dr. Domingue to start his presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, now it's, I'm, uh, I'm uh, going to share my screen. Uh, do you listen? There is a problem uh, for the VIEV. Uh, can I start? Yes, please start. You can see your screen. OK, thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, good afternoon to all, good afternoon to all attendees and uh, speaker. I am Ayoka Domingo from Italy, and uh, it is uh, a pleasure to see uh, in this uh, webinar about forensic shines. As a member of the organizing committee, I will uh, allow me to give thanks to, uh, uh, to Navaz, uh, to Sandy, to Dr. Shembri, to the other speaker around the world, uh, my friends, uh, uh, Vini Sharma from Gagultias University, criminologist Laura Petler from the United States of America, Martina Barberi from Italy, Giuseppina Seppini from Italy, and the other speaker around the world. It is a, a pleasure to stay here with 
uh, you uh, with you all in this event. My short presentation is uh, the topic of my short presentation is uh, the geographical offending profiling in criminal investigation. So we will see what is investigative method, this investigative technique <clears throat> to try to answer to the main question of uh, this presentation. Is the offender predicable? To, uh, to answer this question, we will see the theoretical framework of geographical offender profiling. Uh, and at the end of this uh, short theoretical frame, uh, we'll see also a comparative uh, uh, spatial uh, analysis between two serial offender. I want to start this presentation talking, uh, saying that uh, in every crime, during uh, crime analysis, we have uh, two main objective elements, the, uh, the, the time and the location. In fact, uh, the only certain time in any crime, violent crime, crime, expressive crime, is that the offender and the victim come together at a particular time and a particular location. So during a criminal investigation, during a crime analysis, we have to analyze the, the transaction between person, offender and the victim, offender and target, place, crime scene, and time. This is the three elements of uh, uh, the three, the two, uh, the two or three elements of the crime, uh, of, uh, crime analysis. Uh, this is uh, an objective, uh, this is, there are an objective elements. You can say that uh, we have also other objective elements of crime analysis, like the, like, the example, the victim of, of crime. And uh, it is a nice consideration. But because uh, uh, the, the study of, of the victimology uh, uh, is uh, a good, a nice starting point to understand, uh, the, to understand the possible relationship between the offender and the victim. But uh, sometimes we haven't uh, any information about uh, who is the victim. We, have, uh, we haven't any information uh, about the victim of a crime. And uh, what we have, is uh, the crime scene, is the location of a crime, is the coordinate, the landmark, the place when the crime occurs, at what time the crime occurs. So we can say that there is a rule of a place in, uh, in the crime. In fact, crime has uh, a geographical quality, crime is not randomly distributed, crime is, is concentrated into a place of activity. Series of a crime follow a geographical pattern. At this uh, geographical pattern, can, uh, uh, it is uh, a partial answer of, uh, of the main question of this presentation. Is the offender, is, uh, is the offender predicable? Well, the crime location as a physical evidence act as a clue. In fact, when a crime occurs, it happens at a place with the geographical location. There are four basic uh, dimensions for understanding the crime the legal dimension, victim dimension, the offender dimension, and finally, the spatial dimension. The crime must happen somewhere in the place. And about uh, the criminal activity of the offender in the spatial uh, dimension, we can say that crime don't occur randomly. Well, the offender may be a bad boy or, ba or a bad girl, and so they think differently. They think the same as the rest of the us spatially. It is... Uh, only uh, it is different only how they use for criminal reasons that space that uh, uh, that differ this consideration uh, means that uh, it is possible find a spatial decision process of the offender in fact like uh, all of the as the offenders stay in predicable area within the home or comfort zone when they commit crimes as the other prefer to remain within their comfort zone or home area for shopping, eating, playing sports. So the offender tend uh, to stay close to home or around the key points of their normal daily activity. In the 1981, Paul, a British Brandigan, created the typical structure of the offender spatial behavior, noting that the pattern is associated uh, very close to the offender non-criminal daily activity. The offender is the center of offending, and the offender move out from uh, this point in order to commit their crimes in, uh, in uh, the awareness space. The offender selection 
uh, the target selection by an offender, especially by a serial offender, is subject to several decisional processes about where they decide to the offend. Economic cost, cost of movement, time limiter, efforts, risks, and also potential benefit and gain associated to the offending uh, specific target. In summary, as baseline, the decision on where offend is influenced by decision making process affected by familiarity of play space and ranked by balancing the cost and benefit uh, associated to criminal activity. Because the offender tend to commit crime within the normal daily activity space, the crime are often uh, committed in locations that are closer to the home base, as we see in the following table. The this table shows the distance uh, traveled uh, by an offender found in different crime. As we see, there is uh, a, a, a different spatial pattern. Robbery business, at the, at the example, uh, burglary uh, domestic serial, uh, arson, rape in Italy, homicide in Italy. Um, the result, as we see, the result is different. And the main distance from home to crime location were relatively short, with the crime of the arson, the homicide occurring under two kilometers from the offender on base. At the other side, we have a crime uh, like as a Bulgari or robbery occurred uh, further than three kilometers. And uh, uh, the analysis of uh, this result uh, uh, show a show a several spatial difference between uh, the type of the offender and the crimes. Like, for example, the pop, the property offenses and the offender tend to evolve a high degree of targeting, tend to occur further away from the home at a greater distance. The organized um, and planned offender, like, for example, uh, uh, business uh, business robbery, may travel a further distance to complete a crime. And finally, the crime against the person like, for example, uh, expressive crime, uh, rape, incidental assault, and uh, we can say also the arson tend to occur much closer to home because uh, they are often spont uh, uh, spontaneous, opportunistic offenses that occur within the normal daily activity. All offenses, uh, all these crime are influenced by distance kai function, by distance kai principle. Distance kai principle is uh, uh, one of the most uh, important uh, principles about geographical offender profiling. And now let's we see what is the distance ICAI function. This image shows the distance ICAI function in relation to series of rape in Milan, in Italy. In investigative context, distance ICAI pattern represents the empirical confirmation that the crime committed by serial offender degrees as the distance between the crime scene and this zone increase. About the distance ICAI function, I won't say that uh, this function, this principle, does not have the same adherence in all crime because we will have a different crime typology, instrumental crime, expressive crime, crime against person, crime against uh, property, different, uh, different offender. You will offender, old offender, as, and different sociodemographic uh, characteristic uh, in relation to race, age, and gender, different uh, move, environment and opportunity to, to offend. The consequence of this, of this several condition is a different uh, movement, a different journey uh, of offender in uh, environmental scenario. And last things about the distance kai pattern is the fact that, that, that this function is based on uh, aggregate data. So this means that, uh, that a single offender can show a different spatial pattern from the result of the aggregate data. And now, let's we see geographical offender profiling. This is the practice of using the spatial pattern to, uh, of the offender to improve the criminal investigation is called geographical offender profiling. Mm, geographical offender profiling is an investigative technique. Uh, geographical offender profiling is the study of the relationship between the possible offender on base and the geographical crime scene distribution. Geographical profiling don't solve a crime, 
geographical profiling look to geographical evidence left by the, the offender to indicate a priority area for the investigation. Let's, uh, let's see what geographical profiling do, does and what uh, geographical profiling isn't. Geographical profiling uh, prioritizes the area for the investigation, help to manage the investigative information, is based on where is the offender and not uh, on who is the offender. Geographical profiling isn't an X mark method, isn't a substitute of uh, investigative activity. Geographical profiling isn't a crime mapping. We use crime mapping for uh, urban security planning. Uh, crime mapping focuses on hotspot of crime. Geographical profiling is used in criminal investigation. Geographical profiling focuses on, uh, uh, on, uh, on offenders, single offender or small group of the offender. And now, uh, let's we see the definition of geographical offender profiling. Geographical offender profiling is an operational intelligence and investigative uh, analysis technique supporting the criminal investigation that allows us to identify the possible area of bank and offender residence or the operational base, the offender, through the analysis of geographical crime scene. About the concept of geographical crime scene, you can see in my paper, uh, uh, I shared the link at, uh, at the end of this presentation to download this paper. This technique uses different crime sites at least five First encounter site, uh, offender victim, apprehension site, murder rape site, dump site, location where weapon uh, personal, personal items of victim was found, location of the other geographical trees. This, uh, uh, this site are related to single criminal event. In this case, we have a different crime site of the same crime. This uh, uh, site are also uh, related to, to a series of crime. In this case, we have crime scene geographically dispersed for different but linked crime, like, for example, serial murder, serial rape, bombing, serial uh, robberies, credit card fraud. And finally, this technique that uses different crime sites can establish some relevant place for the investigation can establish the operational base of the offender, the anchor point of the offender, can establish some site, some uh, area, some zone for uh, the investigation, like, for example, the zone of offender residence, the area of possible workplace, the area of social place of the offender, a point, an area where the offender start is a criminal activity in the space, like, for example, a bar, a street, uh, as a commercial center, uh, um, a park, uh, a parking. This is the, the geographical profiling process. The first phase is identify a crime series, evaluate the suitability for geographic profiling, verify the linkage analysis, develop a scenario, create uh, the geographic profile, prepare a suspect list, produce a, a, a report, a geographic profile, and suggest the possible investigative strategies. And uh, this is the, the paper of uh, it is impossible to uh, find the concept of geographical crime scene. It is an open access paper, and this is the link where uh, it is possible to download this, uh, this paper. And now, uh, after the theoretical framework of geographical profiling, let's we see a comparative spatial analysis between a two serial serious offender with the use of the support of the support of the investigative geographic profiling software. As we know, geographical offender profiling is based on two components, qualitative components and the quantitative components. About the qualitative com components, you can say that uh, uh, to understanding the criminal behavior, you need to, we need to understand uh, how place, how space, how, uh, uh, how people, uh, how routine activity uh, influenced which crime occurs, when crime occurs, and the what, uh, and uh, uh, which crime occurs, when crime occurs, 
and uh, uh, at what time the crime occurs. So it is important to analyze the qualitative aspect of uh, the criminal scenario, of the environmental criminal scenario. In fact, the qualitative component of the geographical prof uh, geographic profiling process is the analysis of several factors that uh, could be used to improve the production and, to, and the examination of how the offender's spatial pattern may have been influenced by victim activity, physical or mental barriers, zoning, transportation route, locality sociodemographic, police presence. At the other side, we have a quantitative component of geographical, um, geographical profiling, and uh, we refer to uh, this component with, uh, uh, with decision-making support store, with, this computer, with the specific software program. And the, the software of geographic profile used in this essential analysis, in this next analysis, is the, uh, the Dragnet created by David Kanter. The program analyzes the fundamental points of the geographical crime scene in order to predict the possible location of the offender residence. A risk surface is produced where the red color shows an area most likely that will contain the home base of the offender. And now let's we see the first case. The first case, the first uh, uh, case of this uh, comparative spatial analysis, the elderly female serial killer, is an historical serial murder case in south of Italy. Um, this uh, uh, this is uh, one of few studies in Italy with the use of dragnet uh, system. As done see by the name of a serial killer is known in Italy as the Italy female serial killer. He was arrested in 1997. Uh, between the 1996 and 1997, uh, there were two, uh, 12 homicides of Italy women killed in their in Puglia region in south of Italy, killed in their apartments with the stab of woods to the neck. DNA evidence was found in one of these cases. This, uh, this table shows the chronological this, the event. We have 12 homicides between April 1996 and September 1997, and three homicides uh, in 1995. The geographical offender profile of this serial killer is based on 12 geographical crime scene. I excluded for, for methodological consideration in relation to geographical profile and principle the three homicides in 1995 because about the, uh, the homicide in June 1995 uh, in Foggia, there are some doubts in relation to the, the nature of this murder because the event was, cl was classified by the investigation as natural death case. The homicide committed in Melfi was located in another region, so it is uh, appearing as an outlier in, the, in relation to geographical profiling principle. And uh, uh, this location, can increase more the search area for the investigation. And finally, the Palagiano case in 1995 uh, was excluded because it already showed the same spatial pattern of the homicide uh, number nine, occurred uh, in uh, uh, July 1997. This, uh, this scenario show the geographical crime scene. I divided uh, Mm, I divided uh, uh, all geographical crime machine in two clusters, North cluster and South cluster. We have uh, two different criminal range of the offender, and uh, we will see, we will have a two different uh, geographical profile of the offender. In this presentation, in this analysis, we will see only the North cluster where there is located uh, the, the offender residence. Well, this is the geographical profile of the offender with the use of the Dragnet system. Uh, as we see, this is the general view. Uh, the geographic profile contains six geographic crime scene in relation to North cluster. And this image shows the particular view of a geographical profile of the offender. As we see, the offender residence is located in, uh, is inside the red zone peak profile area. In fact, the offender residence is located in Cerignola and Cerignola is the city, the town of uh, the other homicide of uh, the crime scene number four. And the distance between the crime scene number four 
and uh, uh, find a residence is uh, under one kilometer. So we can say that uh, in this case, uh, geographical profile produce a good result and another, a nice result for the investigation, identifying uh, the, the location of the offender inside the red zone, inside the peak profile area. And now let's we see the second the case of this analysis of this short spatial comparative spatial analysis is uh, uh, the location is the case is the BT Kappa case, Dennis Reader, a serial killer, a serial murderer in the uh, United States of America. Dennis Reader is a serial offender in Kansas, act uh, from uh, 1974 and 2005, murdered 10 people from uh, 1974 and 1991. It was caught in 2005. The geographical profile of this uh, offender is based on uh, seven geographical crime scene. This is the list of victim, 10 victim between 1974 and 1991. And now let's we see the geographic profile of this uh, serial killer with, uh, uh, with the, the programs that I use it. Dragnet uh, use uh, two different uh, uh, distance factions, Manhattan distance and Euclidean distance. The Manhattan distance is associated to, according to the main expert, is, uh, is associated to uh, the layout of the city of North America. This geographical profile show the, show the profile of the offender, uh, the geo profile of the offender uh, with the use of Manhattan distance function. As we see, the offender residence is inside the red zone peak profile area at the north between, in fact, the location of the offender is located between the crime machine number five and the crime machine number seven. This is a geographic profile of the offender using uh, uh, Manhattan distance function in the dragnet. The second geographic profile that I, I was, uh, that I prepared is, uh, is a geographic profile with the, with the use of Euclidean distance. As we see, the red zone is at the south of the residence. This red zone is an offender familiarity area. And now let's we see why this uh, red zone, why this zone is uh, a familiarity area for the offender and why he committed the crime in this area. And last things, the Euclidean distance, according to the major uh, expert, is uh, associated uh, to um, to uh, layout of a city in uh, in Europa, in European, the, to the, the to the layout of a European city. And now let's we see why this uh, BTK show this spatial pattern between the north and south of the area of the homicide. We what is BTK? Dennis uh, Reader lived at the Independent Street in Park City in the, in the red zone, peak profile area according to the geographic profile of the offender with the Manhattan distance. The offender was an ADT home security installer associated situated in Vichita area. In this familiarity area where, of course, one two, three, four, five of the homicide. Was a scout leader, city dog warden, Park City, at Park City, at the north area of the homicide, in this zone, between, uh, in, this, uh, in this zone near the, uh, the, the, the offender residence. Was a crystal lateral charge minister at Hillside Street, in the, at the south of crime machine number seven. Always uh, he, uh, he show always the same pattern in this area because this area is, fam is a, a familiarity area for the offender. And finally, his wife worked at uh, an hospital situated at Kellogg Avenue at south of the homicide area between the Otero family crime scene and the Nancy Fox homicide crime scene situated uh, between the crime scene number one and the crime scene number four. And... Uh, on the, uh, this consideration uh, uh, leads that uh, the offender uh, know, well know uh, this area. Well, I finished I finish my presentation. 
at the end of this presentation, uh, the question is, uh, is the offender predicable? Well, we can't say if the offender uh, is uh, psychologically predictable, but we can say that the offender, an offender, is geographically predictable, as we see in this, uh, in this uh, partial, in this limited comparative uh, spatial analysis between uh, these two offenders. Well, if there are any questions, we can write me to my contact. Uh, I am uh, will happy to, uh, to answer to you. Thank you so much to all. And uh, as a member of the Organizing Committee, uh, I want to uh, uh, give thanks, a special thanks to Navas, to Sandy, to Professor Dr. Shembri, to all attendants and uh, all uh, the other speakers around the world. It is a pleasure. I hope to see you again. Have you a nice day. Have you a nice webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Domingo. Thank you for the great presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you to all. Thank you. Okay. Our next uh, speaker is Dr. Astitu Anand. He is from Forensic Science Laboratory, Home Department, Government of Gujarat, India. And he is going to give a presentation on uh, recent uh, advancements in crime scene investigation. Our novel, okay. And I request Dr. Rasitu Anand to start his presentation. Okay. First of all, uh, thanking you, Global Scientific Guild, for providing me this opportunity to present. I'm uh, Dr. Asitu Anand and uh, serving as Scientific Officer Class 2 Gazetteer at uh, Forensic Science Laboratory, Home Department, Government of Gujarat. Can you, uh, uh, it is visible, my uh, presentation slides? Yes, yes, it's visible. Please continue. Hello? Yes, it is visible. Your screen is visible. Okay, Please so continue. it is a full screen? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so now my topic is uh, for the novel different devices uh, which are right now available into the crime scene investigation. So they are basically a part of kit or or maybe a different different things or tools which would be useful for collection of the particular samples or evidence or maybe sometimes to do on-site application or on-site analysis of these particular samples. Okay, so these are some names of different tools, say knife chisel, hammer, which are uh, very uh, simple things available and uh, which would be helpful us to collect the samples in different manner, which type of cut you have to do, in which uh, you want a slant, section, anything. So these particular uh, tools are available in crime scene kit, which would be helpful for the collection of the sample purpose. So these are some other uh tools you can uh, see them by name i'm not going in detail i'm i'm mainly presenting some very interesting things which are very much useful in uh, crime scene right now so these are some another tools it is a general kit it is having flashlight uv light screwdriver everything fingerprint lifting tape any sample collection uh, it, it is available in general kit okay now wow. this one is very okay so uh now it is uh, say we are uh, you are uh, you are seeing this particular alcohol taster okay what will be there there will be some uh, alcohol consumption by people and they drink and drive so during their uh, particular this kind of cases if they encountered by police people these kind of taster or uh, uh, some forensic expert is having this particular taster he can directly measure this particular concentration of alcohol by using this particular tool. So what we have to just do, if uh, uh, a person is drunk, he has to blow that, uh, blow the some exhaled air or say blow some air into a tip of this particular device. 
Now what will be there? This device will be collecting the sample, and based on the sample concentration in exhaled air of that person, will be given or indicate indicated in say blood alcohol concentration in milligram per uh, percentage milligram per liter, and the government has given the limit say uh, 50 milligram. So based on that particular limit. We can decide whether this is punishable offense or not on the spot on the site. Okay. Now another tool is audio video sunglasses or say wireless audio video sunglasses. Now this is very novel tool. Say uh, if you have a mobile connection with you and uh, some people in forensic science are learning or say training. So they have this particular device with them expert available at the forensic science laboratory itself can give them a guidance on site during the visit or say during crime scene investigation this device would be helpful say how this device itself is a video and audio recording it is a sunglass a person has to wear it and after wearing this particular sunglass that uh, crime scene which is uh, right now in in the uh, presence of an investigator can be seen and, and can be captured can be stored even into the mobile by use of memory cards or say some other storage devices hard disk or anything at the center and it is connected online so a person who is with visiting crime scene or say visiting any uh, investigation scene uh, there itself he directly can have record or documentation of this particular scene itself and during seeing this particular scene if any evidence keep left or any anything has been left from his side an expert uh, watching itself at the laboratory can give them guidance okay the same it is a, a parameter or say mentioning uh, how much battery time it is uh, going to have it is how much dimension which kind of uh, lcd displays that it is their specifications Next is a bank note validator. So nowadays uh, there are, uh, although in India there is a demonetization, okay, but although uh, there are uh, many fake currencies, counterfeit currencies are in market, okay, although they are new. So these kind of detectors or validators can be helpful to identify different UV, uh, uh, different UV, uh, it is having different UV lands, okay. So if on based of different wavelengths, a person can identify or say uh, uh, detect some individual parameters which are kept by government and identify this part particular note or validate them on site. So if they are fake or uh, say th they are uh, original one, we can distribution on, on site of application. Okay. Next is a detection dogs. So now as we know there is difference between uh, different different kind of uh, species of dogs but labrador and uh, german shepherd are very much useful species to identify some particular drugs say explosives some narcotics or any substance which is of uh, say forensic investigation purpose okay but what is the situation there in India or say in Israel or in or many countries, these police dogs are very uh, individually trained. Say a, a dog trained for drugs can only detect uh, drugs only. Okay, a, a dog trained for explosives can be only uh, useful to identify explosive uh, substances. So they have only individual uh, quality, but say for police dog it they can also be in uh, used in security purpose also but but for forensic dogs if they are trained well they can be helpful uh, to identify various say it, it can be a universal dog it can be a versatile dog which can detect uh, different bank notes say some ivory substances uh, some uh, uh, say metals narcotics explosive anything which is fishy or under suspicion can be uh, helpful uh, can be detected by dogs by using their help 
even i myself having one labrador which is uh, trained by me itself so uh, it can detect drugs and explosive both so th this is a very novel area where uh, forensic has to be uh, say uh, dogs uh, are of canine family canine family and this particular family is very ha having very strong uh, say uh, nasal receptors uh, so that this particular thing can be helpful in forensic itself this is a dog training kit uh, which is a training collar itself uh, if you have to keep it uh, in 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 the surrounded uh, on the neck of that particular dog and it it can be helpful for 500 meter range to train them by uh, blowing whistle or by by providing some particular sound and generating uh, some particular vibration they can be trained this is a docu center which is also a uh, helpful in on site application of different document examinations okay so if a particular document which is a say suicide note from the crime scene investigation or some fake uh, documents or uh, say forged documents some particular documents which which are uh, questioned itself so that can be uh, analyzed on site it is having a range of uh, here we can see 742 1100 nanometer so this range is a wide range so uh, on the basis of this particular uv visible or ir range these particular uh, say check uh, like uh, credit cards anything bank notes passports any document which can be uh, uh, light sensitive or say luminescent in nature can be examined on site this is a specification of that docu center say which kind of uh, color range and which kind of source which is a power supply what is operating uh, say uh, power supply has to be there docu center again another type of docu center so it uh, it is a document scanner it can detect different types of explosive or say uh, some trace amounts of narcotic substance also it can be helpful for detection of rdx pt and tnt semtex ngnc nitrate anything can be detected say it is a uh, very helpful for 40 different explosives so these kind of uh, substance which are uh, say very uh, particular for uh, say this is like for 40 different explosives so it is having a individual wavelength given for these particular uh, substance which are uv active or or on which wavelength they are uv active so based on that it is measuring a single hit so based on that it is very uh, say specific to detect for 40 different explosives another thing is a drug detector which is an uh, chemical test itself this kind of pouch is coming these pouch are helpful to detect different drugs we have, what we have to do we have to simply take the uh, drug samples and and fill that particular drug samples into this particular wells and and then there will be uh, some glass uh, or uh, contain glass or plastic container or sometimes we have to dip this particular uh, dropper and what we have to do uh, either if, if it is a glass we have to break that particular glass and that reagent will be itself mixed into that drug and say on site we have a color change or say we have a identification of different amphetamines cocaines barbiturates benzodiazepines so these kind of drugs can be on site uh, detected uh, these are uh, based on the functional group detection so it is a preliminary test but either uh, we can give that uh, whether this particular group or class was present in the drug which was seized from crime scene investigation okay the another type of drug test kit is a uh, sim simply like an uh, paper chromatography or uh, say a particular chip based so what will be there if you see if you have seen in market there is a like pregnancy test like that only it is a well what we have to do we have to uh, solubilize our particular drug or substance or any chemical which is a uh, fishy for uh, say any white color salt which is fishy at uh, crime scene that we have to detect we have to just solubilize into particular solvent and then we have to just put the put the drop of it if 
it is uh, individually given control side so once it is uh, this particular sample has been run that control will be uh, giving uh, that particular uh, say band with I, with this particular band we can uh, com compare this particular drug which is uh, seized and which is controlled after that we can uh, preliminary identify say qualitatively we can say whether this particular drug was present or not and for further investigation it can be sent to forensic science laboratory itself this is uh, the same drug testing kit now this is uh, something very unique explosive isolation unit so sometimes what happens there are some active bombs there are some bombs or in uh, say improvised explosive devices available at crime scene which are uh, very dangerous say uh, some different type of bomb which are uh, which are uh, active at the crime scene so these kind of device are made up of very heavy stainless steel material so this can be a safe storage for even not even for explosive it can be uh, safe storage for some firearms which are loaded itself so these kind of devices helpful to keep the sample itself safe and then it uh, make it uh, to the transported to the forensic science laboratory these are the specification given external in inner size and weight now this one is the same explosive and narcotic trace detector but what it is based on the principle of luminescence so it will be uh, say uh, we have to prepare some particular solvent and then fill that it, that particular sample into the curvet but again it is not like uv visible spectroscopy or, or say fluorescent spectroscopy in the lab but it is very fast and and very selective based on the wavelength given into the software and based on that it can uh, differentiate cocaine opiates cannabis amphetamine any type of stimulant any material explosive narcotic can be detected on site these are the specification of the same instrument this is explosive identification set say now uh, there will be different kind of explosive available once you go to the crime scene there are different types of explosive available uh, say if they are seized you have rdx petn semtex you have n4 ammonium nitrate and for prills so these are particular reagent bottles and and some containers are given and and there is one chart itself given with it so uh, based on that particular chart that uh, reagent has to be mixed on the spot so it is a uh, uh, spot test we can do on site and then we can tell which kind of particular explosive device was encountered explosive uh, molecules were encountered it is of 1 to 4 kg but based on uh, which uh, specification we have purchased uh, there are different uh, identification set coming say uh, some are coming with uh, limited rdx pat and uh, semtex and some are coming with each and every uh, chemical test for explosive again the same group are given group a b and c based on that there will be a, some nitro aromatic some nitramine some are nitra esters so based on the group it will be detected this is the same explosive detection kit it is a uh, based on uh, only semtex c4 tnt rdt rdx and petn but the result are very accurate and it is a fast color test giving kit so that's why i have uh, showed it uh, differently in different slide this is explosive trace detection system this can be uh, present into the mobile unit say mobile uh, one what could be it is a very uh, small level or say is a very uh, small unit of mass spectrometer itself there will be a quadrupole there will be a some uh, ionization but there will be no column for the separation there will be no chromatography itself but direct ionization will occur and based on the ionization we can confirm whether which molecule say which chemical or which poison molecule is available at the crime scene so it is a very fast detecting uh, device 
this is fire investigation kit once we are going for arson or say fire investigation site we have to have these kind of tools which would be helpful to collect us the burned unburnt particles charred particles any substances which are uh, say very sensitive so uh, based on that uh, particular hydrocarbon or say based on that particular uh, petrol diesel or kerosene uh, for detecting them we have to uh, send them to fsl with very uh, say uh, taking precautions like uh, there will be some hydrocarbons which are volatile in nature so uh, there are some containers steel containers glass containers coming so these particular containers will be uh, say helpful to have or say aluminum containers based on that particular hydrocarbon or smell or say some kind of history based on that we have to use different containers to uh, collect the samples from fire investigation these are the specification this is again a forensic document analyzer now uh, this is something very unique forensic vehicle laboratory this is what i am talking about it is a mobile forensic one so what are the basic e equipments require an air conditioned fridge emergency generator chromatograph any uh, say uh, semen identification blood identification kit there will be a uh, different uh, sample uh, analysis kit like individually for narcotics for explosive there are different kits available so those all kits are together available in a single one even uh, particularly uh, say dna can be analyzed on site but but it is based on the how much uh, particular budget of that particular laboratory it is but these kind of heavy instruments can also be carried out on the forensic vehicle laboratory how it looks this is a van this is how it looks like it is very a uh, compact design individual kits are in individual bags we are having 30 mobile uh, forensic laboratories in gujarat itself and these ones are helpful to to have each and every say, say biology department chemistry physics toxicology say serology any of the uh, sample material is coming which can be well preserved well collected and if possible it can be analyzed on site so this is how this particular one looks like it is a back back side photo it is the same now uh, another type of case is a fort chechis number identification set okay now what these kind of kits do say uh, particularly we have uh, we have been encountering very different type of cases like car theft or uh, sometimes forging of this particular chechis number engine number battery number tire number many things are there uh, apart from uh, these particular uh, numbers which are originally given what these particular uh, perpetrators or say uh, particular criminals do they they change the number of uh, these uh, say engine number or chechis number on the plate of these particular cars which are stolen cars actually okay so now they have uh, misguised or uh, they have changed the number what, what a forensic person has to do has to uh, apply different types of acids different types of base or water and and by number of uh, repeated uh, attempts this original number which were stamped by the company itself or manufacturing uh, industry itself can be uh, revealed or can be grinded or can be uh, say uh, you by using neutralized or acidic liquid it it can be washed this metal uh, can be revealed and that original number can be uh, detected so this is how this kit is helpful it is having different sprays it is having some different scrubbers some uh, particular acids and 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 distilled water there are number of uh, reagents available in this particular kit this is very unique it is an handheld detector of blood blisters choking and nerve agents okay so now uh, uh what is it it is helpful actually say 
there there is a uh, blood blood as an evidence in the uh, crime scene now what will be there if particular uh, sample is a red color it is a, either it is a blood either it is an animal blood or human blood either it is a, some red color okay so that can be detected by scanning itself on site by putting a tip onto that particular drop or spatter uh, any individual can confirm a forensic expert can confirm whether it is blood or not so that particular sample has to be collected accordingly and this blister and choking nerve agent so say sometimes what will be there say uh, there will be a arson case okay and and for example i am saying you uh, that uh, arson case there will be an anti mortem blister available on the body of that particular person okay now uh, if it is a post mortem blister there is difference of the presence of amount of albumin and chlorine okay so now what will be there if a person is having albumin it is a post mortem anti mortem amount will be same but for chlorine it is not same chlorine will be present more into the anti mortem blister and post mortem blister it will be lesser in amount so thus we can tell actually whether this particular blister say pus or anything which is encounter so thus we can uh, tell whether the fire injury or uh, or say burning was anti mortem or post mortem okay so this is how this device would be helpful uh to identify some particular blisters choking and nerve agents uh, there are many nerve agents say chloracetophenone and many things many individual chemicals which can be also identify this particular device handheld detector for chemical warfare agents again same for toxic chemical some plant poison materials there is having some library into the, this particular uh, device and there will be a memory card so based on the spectroscopic observations or say spectroscopic wavelength available or based on that this particular device will be helpful for testing mode and and uh, ba based on these it can tell us on limited a uh, number of say uh, there there is a library of narcotics uh, for 300 substances and for chemical warfare agents it is for 50 to 60 substances but the limited uh, uh, substance or toxic chemicals can be detected using this and even uh, quantitation can be done handheld detector of same again a different kind of uh, device it is a again handheld detector of chem explosive chemical warfare agents and toxic it is having different uh, principle the the uh, application is same but the, it is having different principle of detection so this is how i conclude there are different devices available into the market which could be helpful us to uh, investigation uh, investigate a crime scene uh, very keenly and application of this device will would is is the uh, procedure or say protocol and whether uh, which kind of sample is there whether uh, which uh, a white salt is either drug or narcotics or explosive so that can be uh, said easily on site and thus it can be relatively sent to the individual department precisely okay uh, thank you for listening me any question you can ask me thank you dr asita it was really an excellent presentation thank you so much i will open to questions now any questions for dr astito uh uh dr anand yes ma'am uh, yeah yeah dr rakhi here from uh, state forensic science laboratory jaipur uh, okay. wonderful presentation from your side thank and, you uh, uh, yeah yeah i'm slightly busy uh, uh, doing some home affairs but uh, i'm continue to listen your uh, this presentation and uh, very much keen to know about all the kits available at your end and yeah. uh, because the time is limited to me and i would like to get your email id and uh, the presentation uh, 
a copy if you can provide us and number so that we can contact further sure sure you have to strengthen my laboratory because uh, i am also a toxicologist and uh, uh, dealing with the training part and uh, looking to all the aspect uh, of the kits uh, which uh, you people have available uh, i think you are using all these kits uh, in the crime laboratory also in the toxicology field no no no, no ma'am not on the laboratory but on the crime scene investigation we are using some kits and some kits are very uh, uh, of limited purchase okay so due to uh, maybe a budget constraint they are available at office so if there is some individual unique case or say high profile or some uh, importance is there then we'll be using these particular kits on site so are you dealing with some crime cases also so that you comes to know about all these kits yes 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 i am uh, doing crime scene investigation since last 3 years and uh, right now i am ma'am scientific officer class 2 as a cadet am the vice president okay nice to see and wish to get all the details of the available kit so as uh, we can also strengthen our laboratory in the same pattern uh kindly share your number sure yeah. and thank you so much for the wonderful presentation thank you ma'am Uh, any more questions okay thank you so much dr asit anand thank you it was really excellent and moving on our uh, next speaker is uh, sagar bhomik he is from national forensic sciences university india and he is going to give a presentation on luminescent uh, nanostructures and nano assemblies for forensic investigations and i request uh, sagar to start his presentation my slide is visible yes yes yes, yes. please continue oh thank you global forensic webinar team for inviting me for this so i am basically presenting today for development of new material for forensic investigations so basically i am a material scientist so i develop different things which can be helpful to a new age investigation for forensic science so today i am uh, talking about two materials we have developed in our laboratory in forensic technology laboratory in nfsu so thing we have developed for fingerprinting so whenever finger touch uh, an object as you people on know so it creates a fingerprint which is latin fingerprint so like a fingerprint there is in three level we have identified the first level is pattern one that is a pattern the level two is minutia points and third level is pores and ridges continues so with that so first we have to use a forensic torch for the fingerprinting then sequencing for different processing like powder dusting very basic process then organic dyes are there and then fluorescent dyes are there for better resolution and super glue fuming is there vacuum matter these are all the known processes so what we can develop through nanotechnology that in forensic investigation for development of latent fingerprints so we have we think about and then we have decided that we have some limitations in current latent finger development like resolution is not adequate in fingerprinting we can't detect exogenous materials like that uh, in fingerprinting we can't determine that some explosives they have handled or not some drugs they have handled or not and can't detect the age of the fingerprints so these are the limitations we have found out from review of literature so so we have specified out some demands what we can develop so we have specific some chemical that can develop uh, that latent fingerprint and need specific standardization protocol and can we determine some exogenous spacing like explosives narcotics from that fingerprint can we know some extra information apart from developing that patterns minutia details and like that and can we the last can we determine the age of the fingerprint so the, the, that was our group's first motive that what we can develop so 
after we have decided to take silica nanoparticle for development of latent fingerprinting why silica is important because silica is a very common cheap material through nanoparticle and then we have searched amphiphilic silica there was no search report of amphiphilic silica nanoparticle for development of latent fingerprinting like why amphiphilic silica particle because the size shape surface functional groups are most importantly the surface charge of the fingerprinting is very important because fingerprint contains some water amino acid proteins fatty acids sterols lipids and various inorganic salts there are a mix of hydrophilic and hydrophobic compounds so they will help to determine the better resolution of fingerprinting so we have used that can we develop some amphiphilic silica nanoparticle for that that we can uh, develop a better resolution fingerprinting so there was no such report still now that we have reported in australian journal of science in 2019 that uh, our that paper of this work so process so after that we have used several chain length as you see this silica 1 silica 2 silica 3 4 5 there are several chain lengths we have used chain length 5 10 11 and like that so then we have compared with developed different fingerprinting this is the very basic process with i don't go with this the details so we have then gone for characterization this character like this characterizations uh, suggest that our uh, uh, two theta angle is 22 degree this is our basic cubical method method that is 100 100 cubical process and we have one binding energy also so in binding energy we have gone said that we have silicon and carbon has very uh, two one plus four oxygen state in platinum has in plus two oxygen we have all seen that that all our silica what is the state of the silica so after that we have gone for uh, FTIR and absorption and emission spectra. So this FTIR states that the CH bond, acyl and bond is present. And with that chain length around this area, around 1200 to 1300 area, that SIOH bond is changing due to the chain. Length. And that absorption spectra is around uh, 1000 to 2000 around. And uh, in emission spectra, you can see it in 500 to 600 around. After that, adding of that. So this uh, TAM, the same image suggests that, that the size of the nanoparticle is 135 to uh, uh, 10 nanometer around with that analysis. And the major point is that our nanoparticle and then our material is not aggregating from that same image. We can So this uh, same image and TAM also found that there is no aggregation of that compound. And this optical image is also supporting that data. So we have gone for development of different fingerprints. Like if you can easily, what was under and our understanding that the, as fingerprint have as hydrophilic and hydrophilic compound. So amphiphilicity will be for better resolution. You can see, see from that uh, A, B, C, D, E, there are the uh, chain length, different chain lengths. As we've uh, gone for higher chain lengths and T up to till uh, silicon silica five, the resolutions get better. So we have tried with that we have synthesized that five silica nanoparticles with different density. That chain length 11 is the best, like you can found in sample E. And for sample, you have gone for minutia details. We have that better resolution of that with that. So we have also compared that uh, nanoparticles with that commercially available fingerprint. These are the better resolution than the commercial label of fingerprints. Then we have gone for the age fingerprint is that all developed fingerprints have an aging effect. So with the all are up to 20 days to 30 days and develop the fingerprints. We have shown that these are up to 20 days fingerprints. The fluorescence property of blue, uh, green color also. This is the resolution of that we have gone to the optical microscope. The resolution is quite good. We can easily differentiate the mind, different patterns, but pattern to pattern three. So we have developed a fingerprint. We can uh, fill fingerprints. So um, that can develop 
uh, luminescent finger marks and easily different age finger marks. So our one demand was that, can we develop something that can detect exogenous materials from fingerprints? So we have developed one C platinum CNN complex, which is green color fluorescence. So you can see uh, some spectra and M spectra, then emission spectra is around five or six sizes, which register uh, green color of fluorescence. So this molecule can detect explosives. So we have already established in our Langmuir paper. Like uh, in strip based, it can up to detect explosives up to PPT level, parts per trillion level by fluorescence quenching. The fluorescence activation spectra is there. So what we did, we did, we added that um, platinum molecule with our MP silica six, that amphiphilic silica. So now it is amphiphilic as well as that we have added that molecule which can detect explosives. So after that, we have uh, tried with finger, uh, fingerprints, which has handled TNT. It's in just an initial process. We have trying with different variety of uh, explosives. So we can find from fluorescence spectroscopy that in that specific area, like region A, region B, then that fluorescence is quenching. So this is a resemblance that 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 turns or that fingerprints is handled TNT molecule. This is a, we have just proposed a new uh, exogenous material development in that area. So we have developed this uh, fingerprint work uh, through nanotechnology development. So we have completed that work and our recent work are going on different, try different materials like, uh, for uh, narcotics and like that. So. So I am presenting my another work, which is mainly developed for food forensics, and relatively a new area in the forensic science with nanotechnology. Antibiotics is the very important, like the recent reports of antibiotics, like antibiotics in dairy products. So it came in resistance in our body. So we have targeted the quinoline drug. Quinoline drug is mostly used in antibiotic for our dairy products and for our stocks and for excessive antibiotic what harmful it's harmful for our our head. and we have decided our main substrate is will be milk because india is the second place in production in the world so gujarat is the fourth highest milk production state in the country so we have started to decide just how we can develop something that can detect uh, antibiotic on spot. So uh, everyone that uh, in food laboratories and food testings and that can detect antibiotic is present or not in on spot detection techniques. So firstly, we have taken this fluoroquinine based antibiotics for our major interest because they are using in India a lot. So. We, we we first developed old one LCMS method, like preparation of different standard solutions. We have put it in the dark. After that, we have spiked the raw sample with methanol and adjusted pH. These are the basic protocols, which is already available. We have validated that. So with, with gradient elution for water in mobile phase A, and in methanol mobile fish we have developed the LCMS method with MRM positive electrospray annotation. So we have the different retention time of that four uh, antibiotics that fluoroquinine, ciprofloxacin, lamiquinine, is there the different retention times. And we have also gone for that intensity versus correlation curves. It's all suggested that the R square value is coming to 0.99. This suggests quite good. And they had the different retention time precursor science and LCMS based method, or summary data acquisition parameters. The average accuracy we uh, added the samples is average accuracy all is uh, above 99%, and minimum detection level is one nanogram per limit. And we have found the recovery rate more than 90% in everyone. So we have all but these processes are very uh, because CMS is a very costly instrument all not mobile FSLs and like that. All mobile laboratories and regional FSLs can't afford LCMS in very remote places. So we have developed, uh, we have gone for the spiking the sample. Can we detect through LCMS? And we have all established that method. 
and in gujarat we have collected 300 samples in about 20 percent samples have contaminated with fluoroquines we have reported also in some newspapers of india so then we have our main core area that can we develop some material that can detect uh, that antibiotic from milk on the spot so we have chosen lanthanide why lanthanide lanthanide because lanthanide is a very sharp spectra emission spectra like band like spectra lanthanides can be easily sensitized with proper change of ligand so we can develop some ligand with that lanthanides and it can easily bind up and give us some signals that can detect this is antibiotic is present or not they are very high continuity that anti that antibiotic we have diketo bond and diketo bond of that fluoroquine is easily bind with europium terbium that different type of lanthanides so basically our understanding was that that we then we have decided to take lanthanide for our work that we can can lanthanide can work or not so we have the europium dpp3 lanthanide compound so this is the basic process we have developed like europe we have used europium dppm3 phenanthrene and we have adjusted the ph by 6.2 and stir for 65 minutes or 24 hours and cooled under room temperature and dried and in purified with silica column and uh, Eulendos, mineral, and DCM. This is the basic protocol to synthesize that molecule, that Europium CO. And this is the red color of fluorescence. Red color of fluorescence is produced. This is the emission spectra of both. We have developed terbium to Europium. So terbium has uh, green color emission, Europium has blue color. Emission. We both have the same parameters. In Instead of Europium, we have used terbium. We have taken the two nanoparticles of that sample, that what we can do. So this, you can see this both emission and absorption spectra. And for Europium also, that uh, mass spectra, ESI mass spectra studies that compound has synthesized because in the DPP composition to around mass. So this NMR spectra also suggests that com my compound is pure. Uh, HPL spectra and FTI spectra compound that our complex has been synthesized easily. I'm not going to in the details. In same parameter side, like we have used a terbium hexahydrate to save lanthanide of terbium. Now we have two complex, and we have already established they have synthesized with by the, our characterization data. So we have one compound in terbium, one other is europium. The terbium complex is also synthesized. The terbium nitride hexahydrate, the other mass confirms. Now we have gone for fluorescence based titration study. So what we can find with this is A, B, C, D at the different uh, antibiotics what we have chosen for our synthesis. You can see in the picture that fluorescence is going quench. That this is turn off fluorescence. When we add some, the fluorescence gains off, like in light. So we have found that. So this is a very interesting thing. So we can develop some sensors. This is with European complex. But when we go on for the terbium complex, it is turned on. When we add that uh, antibiotic compounds, that fluorescence can turn on. So these are the very uh, important characteristics we have found. So after that, this matrix, we know the material can detect fingerprints. So what we can develop, this is very cheap and we can give it in regular non-costly based method. So at the various spectra that suggest intensity versus concentration that R square is both terbium and European compounds. And stern warm up suggest that very good quenching efficiency is there for fluorescence titration. So now we have dipped some paper strips in that solution and we have developed a paper strip for detection of antibiotics. So you, you can see, see that different solution we have put it in that. So if showing the quenching studies, so it can easily detect antibiotic in real time. So after that, someone suggests that this paper size is big. So we have tried with different small size paper also, the same thing that upper side, like uh, first piece dipped in europium and with different concentration, the color is easy. And after that, we have uh, deep one drop wise also. So these are all showing that good uh, sensor-based papers for detection of antibiotic. So we are working for the um, for development of this device and for technology transfer. So 
and we have also got this this is solid state fluorescence it is liquid state and now it is this solid state fluorescence of this strip we, this is also suggest that our fluorescence is quenching that is very sensor is good so uh, we are developed this two materials now we are going for technology transfer and we are fabricating the device for our fsls we have to go for much higher concentration and uh, everything that can be used as a real time sample so this is my funding agencies i will thank dr maithi my uh, group supervisor dr sakuda from university of tokyo gk lairi from iit bombay and our funding agency csi and crb for that now we are going for development and real time application of that so this is my short of that i am open for questions now Yes. Thank you, Tara. Thank you, Sajid, for the excellent presentation. Yes. Uh, any questions for uh, Sajid? Yeah, Mr. Sajid. Yeah. Tamanna. Good. Good evening. My name is Tamanna. Good evening. I'm from Bangalore. Yeah. yeah. Tell. I am actually a student. Okay. Just one second, yeah. So I I am glad you uh, gave a presentation on forensic nanotechnology because yeah. uh, as far as I know, this is actually a very new field. You know, from the past yeah. five years, I think ten uh, years, five to ten. I I'm not sure how many years, but it wasn't. It's not as old as like toxicology and all the others. And yeah. I am also happy that you. Uh, I will. I all this. All the things that I wanted to learn from this, I also got from your presentation. Such as yeah. you also covered food forensics as well. Yeah. So you, uh, based on the institute that you are in, I wanted to ask you that how is the scenario of these two fields, forensic nanotechnology and uh, food forensics in India, the scope and everything. If someone were to join that institute. Yeah, food food forensics is recently a very growing. the job opportunities are also good but in forensic nanotechnology field is basically a research field in forensic investigation so you can we can't decide that we have to go to for fsl for regular sop follows and regular investigation if you want to pursue your research you can go for forensic nanotechnology field and the nowadays every research paper total 20% of research paper in world scientist community is from nanotechnology and in forensics it's it's less uh, less than 5% of total research papers are in for from forensics okay. so this is a very growing field so we have to develop the fields in india specifically in india yeah. the forensic nanotechnology is not growing as much like forensic toxicology industry. the only thing i've heard about uh, forensic nanotechnology is whatever you said today and about like nano biosensors forensic yeah. nano sensors yeah yeah for uh, uh, measuring gas explosing yeah, gas yeah gas like, gas sensors yeah, yeah. so this is there will, the, these are these things will only be touched upon in uh, universities yeah yeah in university we, we have excellent research facility we have every instruments of uh, like in iit levels we can you can research a lot no issues in that and food forensics is also an emerging field for now yeah, right yeah an emerging field you know the job opportunities are also there in food forensics there are lots of job opportunities are there okay and uh, they also concentrate on like uh, bio weapons and uh, uh, yeah in nanotechnology yeah. nanotechnology basically nanotechnology food forensics our honorable vice chancellor jm vyas sir has uh, coined a term that is called preventive forensics forensics we are dealing with this is after crime so what we can do before crime this is preventive forensics so in the preventive forensic forensic nanotechnology there we have with help of nanotechnology or several material our co-workers are working i how we can develop like lightweight material for bulletproof jacket and light materials for everything lightweight materials these are the preventive forensics so uh, like that is, there is cbrn chemical biological radiological and nuclear work for that we have uh, developed uh, we can develop some nanotechnology based product which is very thing like that so this is also can work on using nanotechnology okay 
thank you sir thank you so much okay. very insightful presentation thank you okay thank you very much okay uh, any more questions okay thank you so much uh, sagar it was a excellent excellent presentation thank you so much okay uh, with this uh, concludes all the talks of talks for the day and uh, <clears throat> i thank uh, all the speakers and participants uh, for attending today and uh, giving their presentations mm. looking forward uh, for tomorrow uh, i wish everybody will join again tomorrow in the morning thank you so much for attending thank you bye bye for now